Section 15 of A History of the Four Georges and William the Fourth, Volume 4, by Justin McCarthy and Justin Huntley McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 74. The Emancipation of Labor. The statesmen who had carried the Reform Bill soon found that they had taken upon themselves a vast responsibility. They had accomplished so great a triumph that most men assumed them to be capable of any triumph. It has to be remembered that they had succeeded in establishing one principle which up to that time had never been recognized, the principle that a constitutional sovereign in these countries cannot any longer set up his own authority and his own will in opposition to the advice of his ministers. Up to the days of William the Fourth, the ministers always had to give way to the sovereign at the last moment, if the sovereign insisted on maintaining his dictatorial authority. We have seen how one of the greatest of English statesmen, the younger Pitt, had bowed his judgment and even coerced into silence the remonstrances of his own heart and his own conscience, rather than dispute the authority of an obstinate and a stupid king. Lord Grey and his colleagues had compelled their king to listen to reason, and probably not even they knew at the time the full importance of the constitutional principle which they had thus established. In our own days, and under the rule of the first really constitutional sovereign who ever reigned in these countries, we seem to have almost forgotten that there ever was a time when the occupant of the throne was understood to have a right to govern the people according to royalty's own inclination or royalty's own notion of statesmanship. When the passing of the Reform Bill was yet the latest event in history, the people of these countries commonly and very justly regarded this assertion of the right of a representative ministry to exact support from the sovereign as one of the greatest triumphs accomplished by Lord Grey's administration. The natural feeling, therefore, was to assume that the men who had done these great things could do greater things still, and from all parts of the realm eyes were turned upon them, full of confidence in their desire and their capacity to accomplish new reforms in every department of our constitutional and social system. The time was one especially favorable for such hopes and for such achievements. A new era had opened on the civilized world. New ideas were coming up regarding the value and the validity of many of our constitutional and social arrangements, which had formerly been considered as inspired and sanctified forever by that mysterious influence, the wisdom of our ancestors. If education had not yet made much way among the masses of the people, at least the belief in popular education was becoming a quickening force in the minds of all intelligent men. Then, as ever since, the agitation for each great new reform began outside the walls of Parliament, and had to take an organized shape before it became a question for the House of Commons. The first great work to which the Reformed Parliament applied itself after the conditions of Lord Grey's Act had been allowed to take effect in remolding the constituencies was the abolition of Negro slavery in the colonies of Great Britain. Domestic slavery and the slave trade had already been abolished, but in the minds of a great number of well-meaning, well-informed, and by no means hard-hearted men, slavery in our colonies was a very different sort of institution from slavery in our islands or from the actual trade in slaves. The ordinary Englishman, when he troubled himself to consider such questions at all, had settled it in his own mind that slavery in England or in any part of the British Isles was incompatible with the free constitution of the realm, and that the forcible abduction of men and women from African seashores in order to sell them into slavery was an offense against civilization and Christianity. But this average Englishman did not see that there was anything like the same reason 
for interfering with the system of slave labor as we had found it established, for instance, in our West Indian colonies. We did not introduce the system there, it was argued. We found it established there. We inherited it, and its continuance is declared by all those who know to be absolutely essential to the production of the sugar which is the source of profit and the means of living to the islands themselves, and an indispensable comfort, a harmless and healthful luxury, to millions of civilized beings who never stood under a tropical sky. The mind of the average Englishman, however, had been for some time much disturbed by the arguments, the pleadings, and the agitation of a small number of enlightened reformers, at first much in advance of their time, who were making a pertinacious crusade against the whole system of colonial slavery. Some of these men have won names which will always be honored in our history. Zachary Macaulay was one of these. He was the father of the Macaulay whom we have just heard of as seated side by side with Charles Greville at Lord Holland's dinner table. Zachary Macaulay had been the manager of a great West Indian estate, but he had given up the position because his conscience would not allow him to have anything to do with the system of slavery, and he had come home to devote his time, his abilities, and his earnestness to the generous task of rousing up his countrymen to a full sense of the horrors which were inseparable from the system. He was able to supply men like Brougham, like Foxwell Buxton, and like Whitbread, with practical facts beyond dispute to establish the realities of slavery in the West Indian colonies. Among the more obvious, though not perhaps even the most odious accompaniments of the system, were the frightful cruelties practiced on the slaves, the flogging, the mutilation, and the branding of men, women, and children, which formed part of the ordinary conditions of a plantation worked by slave labor. Over and over again, it had been denied by men who professed to know all about the subject and to be authorities upon it that any such cruelties were practiced on a well-regulated plantation belonging to a civilized owner. It was constantly argued with self-complacency that the planter's own interests would not allow him thus to mar the efficiency of the human animals he had to do his work, and that even if the planter had no pity for them, he was sure to have a wholesome and restraining consideration for the physical value of his own living property. Zachary Macaulay and the Buxtons and the Wilberforces and the Whitbreds were able to give innumerable and overwhelming proofs that the system every day was working such evils as any system might be expected to work, which left one set of human beings absolutely at the mercy of another set of human beings. Many years after this great controversy had won its complete success for the English colonies, a chief justice of the Supreme Court of the United States laid it down as law that a slave had no rights which his owner was bound to respect. Up to the time of which we are now writing, it was certainly assumed in our West Indian colonies as a self-evident doctrine, utterly beyond dispute or question, that a slave had no rights which his owner was bound to respect. The band of resolute philanthropists who had taken up the subject in England were able to show that frequent floggings of men and women was a regular part of the day's incidents of every plantation, and that branding was constantly used, not merely as a means of punishment, but also as a means of identification. It was a common practice, when a female slave attempted to escape, for her owner to have her branded on the breast with red-hot iron as an easy means of proving her identity if she were to succeed for a time in getting out of his reach. Numbers of advertisements were produced, in which the owners, seeking through the newspapers for the recovery of some of their women slaves, proclaimed the important fact that the fugitive women were branded on both breasts, and that thus there could be no difficulty about their identification. We need not go further into the details of the subject. 
but it may be as well to mention that we have not touched at all upon the most revolting evidences of the horrors which seem to be the inevitable accompaniment of the slave system. Brougham was one of the first among leading Englishmen who threw his heart and soul into the agitation against colonial slavery. Long before that agitation approached to anything like success, he had brought forward a motion in the House of Commons directing attention to the evils and horrors of the system and calling for its abolition. For a time, successive governments did not see their way to go any further than to endeavor to bring about or to enforce better regulations for the use of slave labor on the colonial plantations. Even these modest measures of reform had many difficulties to encounter. Some of the colonies were under the direct dominion of the crown, were governed, in fact, as crown colonies, but others had legislative chambers of their own and refused to submit to the dictation of the authorities at home. These legislative chambers, in most cases, resented the interference of the home government when it attempted to introduce new rules for the treatment of Negro slaves, and the whole plantation interest rallied in support of the great principle that every owner of slaves had an absolute right to deal with them according to his own will and pleasure. It was loudly asserted by the planters and by the friends of the planters, and of course the planters had friends everywhere in England, that the sugar-growing business could not be carried on with any profit except by means of slave labor, and that the slaves could not be got to work except by the occasional use of flogging or other such needful stimulant. The Negroes, it was loudly declared, would rise in rebellion if once it became known to them that the English Parliament was encouraging them to consider themselves as slaves no longer, and their mode of rising in rebellion would simply be a simultaneous massacre of all the planters and their wives and children. See what you are doing, many a voice cried out to the anti-slavery agitators. You are preaching a crusade which will not merely end in the utter bankruptcy of the West Indian islands, but in the massacre of all the planters, their wives, and their children. The agitators, however, were neither dismayed nor disheartened. It would have taken a great deal of sophistry to confuse the conscience of Zachary Macaulay or Wilberforce. It would have taken a good deal of bellowing to frighten Brougham. The agitation went on with increasing force, and Brougham continued to denounce the wild and guilty fantasy that man has property in man. In Jamaica, the colonial legislature, pressed hard by the government at home, passed an act with the avowed purpose of mitigating the severity of the punishment inflicted on slave laborers. The act, however, was, even on the face of it, absurdly inadequate for any humane purpose. The home government had demanded, among other reforms, the entire discontinuance of the flogging of women. The colonial act allowed the flogging of women to go on just as it had before. The Jamaica planters were indignant at the course taken by the home authorities and raved as if they were on the verge of rebellion against the crown and the well-meant interference of the government at home seemed in fact to have done more harm than good. In Demerara, which was the crown colony, some of the more intelligent among the Negro slaves had heard scraps of talk which led them to believe that the King of England and his government were about to confer freedom upon the colored race, and these reports spread and magnified throughout certain plantations, and the slaves on one estate refused to work. Their refusal was regarded as an insurrection and was treated accordingly. The most savage measures were employed to crush the so-called insurrection, just as in more recent and what ought to have been more enlightened days, some local disturbances in Jamaica were magnified into a general rising of the blacks against the whites, and the horrors perpetrated in the name of repression startled the whole civilized world. In Demerara, an English dissenting missionary, the Reverend John Smith, who had been known as a most kindly friend of the Negroes, 
was formally charged with having encouraged and assisted the slaves to rise in revolt against their masters. He was flung into prison, was treated with barbarous rigors such as might have seemed in keeping with some story of Siberia. He was put through the hurried process of a sham trial in which the very forms of law were disregarded, and he was sentenced to death. Even at Demerara and at such a time, the court-martial which had condemned the missionary as guilty of offence with which he was charged had accompanied its verdict with a recommendation to mercy on account of the prisoner's previous good character. But before it could be decided whether or not the recommendation was to have any effect, the unfortunate man died of the treatment he had received. The story of the accusation, the trial, and the death created an immense sensation in England. Brougham, Buxton, Sir James Mackintosh, the historian and scholar, and many others aroused the public indignation by their rightful denunciations of the trial and the verdict. The government condemned and reversed the proceedings at the trial, and when Brougham brought on a motion in the House of Commons, publicly branding with just severity the whole conduct of the Demerara authorities, his motion was only defeated by a small majority. Meanwhile, the agitation against the whole system of colonial slavery was receiving new impulse and new strength from the teaching of new events in the colonies, and in May 1830 a great meeting was held in London to demand not the mitigation but the total abolition of slavery in every land over which the flag of England floated. This meeting was presided over by the great abolitionist William Wilberforce, who had been out of public life for some time owing to severe ill health, and who believed that he could not more fitly celebrate his return to the active life of philanthropy than by taking the chair at such a demonstration. Mr. Buxton proposed a resolution calling on the country to agitate for the total abolition of slavery in the colonies, and to be content with nothing else, and the resolution was carried by enthusiastic acclamation. Brougham at once became the champion of the great London meeting by a motion which he brought forward in the House of Commons. One of the greatest speeches of his lifetime was made in justifying his appeal to the House for the total abolition of a system which admitted of nothing like partial or what is called moderate reform, and must either be swept out of existence altogether, or remain a curse to those who enforce it, as well as to those against whom it is enforced. Brougham's motion was defeated, of course. We say, of course, because it was only a motion made by an independent member, as the phrase goes, and was not proposed by the leader of a strong government determined to stake its existence on the carrying of its proposition. Every great reform, it may almost literally be said, is heralded in Parliament by the motions of independent members, who are sure to be defeated, but whose determined efforts have success enough to make the leader of the government, or the leader of the opposition, feel that the time is near at hand when the cause must be taken up by one or other of the great parties in the state. Buxton raised the whole question in the following session, and then Lord Altrip, speaking for the government, went so far as to offer a sort of compromise by suggesting that the colonies, which in the future should give evidence of their sincere resolve to make distinct improvement in the condition of their slaves, should be rewarded and encouraged by a permission to send their sugar into English ports at a reduced rate of duty. The country, however, had long outgrown the condition of mind in which this feeble and ridiculous proposition could be regarded as worthy of serious consideration. The notion of sacrificing any part of the country's revenues for the purpose of bribing the planters to deal a little less severely with their slaves was not likely to find much favor among the men who had thus far conducted the great agitation against slavery. The object of reformers such as Clarkson, Wilberforce, Buxton, Brougham, and Mackintosh was not merely that the Negroes should be flogged less often, or that the Negro women should not be flogged at all, but that the whole abominable system, 
which made men, women, and children the absolute property of their owners, should be brought to an end forever. At last it became evident to the Whig ministry that something definite must be done, and that nothing would be considered definite by the country which did not aim at the total abolition of slavery. The hour had come, and the man who could best turn it to account in the House of Commons was already in his place. Lord Stanley, who had joined the Reform Ministry as secretary to the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, had since that time been moved to the higher position of colonial secretary, and to him was appropriately confided the task of introducing the measures which the government had determined to take. The Lord Stanley of those days was in after years the Earl of Derby, whom some of us can still call to mind, as one of the most brilliant orators in the House of Lords, at a time when Brougham and Lyndhurst maintained the character of that assembly for parliamentary eloquence. Those among us who remember the eloquent Lord Darby, the Rupert of debate, remember him as a Tory prime minister or the Tory leader of opposition in the House of Lords. But he began his great parliamentary career as a Whig and as a reformer, and he was one of the most zealous of Lord Grey's colleagues in pressing forward the great measure which was carried to success in 1832. Among those who can remember him, there is only one opinion about the high order of his parliamentary eloquence, and that opinion is that he was a worthy rival of Gladstone and of Bright. To him, as colonial secretary, was entrusted the task of bringing forward in the House of Commons the measures of the government for dealing with the question of slavery in the British colonies. Stanley's speech was such a magnificent blending of reason and emotion, so close and so powerful in its arguments, so thrilling in its eloquence, that many of those who heard the speech naturally expected that it was destined to announce a bold and a comprehensive policy. A certain feeling of disappointment came up among the abolitionists when the measures were described which the government had resolved to submit to the House of Commons. What Stanley had to propose was not a complete measure, but a series of resolutions embodying the purposes of the government's policy. It is enough to say that the government proposed a plan which amounted to a scheme of abolition by stages. There was to be a certain period of apprenticeship, a term of fifteen years, during which the slaves, men and women, were to continue to work for their masters as before, under conditions gradually relaxing as the slave drew nearer to the time of emancipation, and then, when that hour at length arrived, the slave was to be free forever. This principle, however, was not to apply to children under six years old at the time of the passing of the measure, or to any children born after that time. The idea on which the whole scheme was founded was the notion very common in that time and since, that the sudden emancipation of any set of human beings could only tend to bewilder them, and to prevent them from making a proper use of the freedom thus abruptly thrust upon them. The fool in the fable, said Macaulay, when dealing with a somewhat similar question, declared that no man ought to go into the water until he had learned to swim. Lord Grey's ministry had apparently much the same idea about the perils of emancipation. Another part of the scheme proposed that fifteen millions should be advanced by the government as a loan to the West Indian planters in order to help them over the diminution of income which might be expected to follow any interference with the conditions of slave labor. The resolutions put forward by the government were regarded as highly unsatisfactory by most of the leading abolitionists. Macaulay indeed argued with all his usual eloquence and skill in favor of the principle of gradual abolition, and it is hardly necessary to say that it was not in that speech he made use of the pithy sentence which we have just quoted. Buxton proposed an amendment to the resolution an amendment, in fact, calling for immediate abolition, and the amendment was seconded by Daniel O'Connell. Buxton, however, was prevailed upon not to press his amendment on the ground that the government 
were as eager for emancipation as any one could be, and that Lord Grey and his colleagues were only anxious to bring forward such a measure as might at once secure the support of the majority and prevent further delay, while securing at the same time the ultimate and not distant settlement of the whole question. O'Connell stood firm, argued strongly against the proposed compromise, refused to accept it, and actually pressed Buxton's amendment to a division. Of course, he was defeated by a large majority, but he carried a respectable minority along with him, and few now can doubt that the amendment which he pressed forward, even after its proposer had abandoned it, was right in principle, and that the government, if forced to it, could have carried a plan for immediate abolition with little more difficulty than was found in carrying the scheme of compromise. As the discussion went on, the government made some further concessions to the abolitionists by reducing the time and modifying the terms of the apprenticeship system, and the abolitionists in general believed it their wisest policy to accept the modified arrangement and thus avoid any further delay. Another alteration of great importance was made by the government in favor of the planters and was finally accepted by the abolitionists and by the country in general. The friends of the planters made strong representations to the effect that the proffered loan would be of no use whatever to the owners of slaves whose property was so soon to pass from their hands into freedom, and that there was not the slightest chance of the planters being able to pay back to the English exchequer the amount that the government was willing to advance. It was urged, too, with some show of reason, that the planters were not themselves responsible for the existence of slave labor, that generations of planters had grown up under the system and had made a profit by it during the days when civilization had not anywhere set its face against slavery, and that it was hard, therefore, to make them suffer in pocket for the recent development in the feelings of humanity. The offer of a loan was abandoned by the government, and it was proposed instead that a gift of twenty millions sterling should be tendered as compensation for the losses that the planters would be likely to undergo. This proposal at first met with some opposition, and by many indeed was looked upon as an extravagant freak of generosity, but some of the leading abolitionists were willing to make allowance for the condition of the planters, and most or all of them were prepared to make a large sacrifice for the sake of carrying some measure which promised, even by gradual advances, the final abolition of the slave system. We may condense into a very brief space the remainder of the story and merely record the fact that the government carried their amended measure of emancipation with its liberal grant to the West Indian planters through both Houses of Parliament, and that it obtained the royal assent. It may easily be imagined that poor King William must have had some mental struggles before he found himself quite in a mood to grant that assent. If the king ever had any clear and enduring opinion in his mind, it probably was the opinion which he had often expressed already against the abolition of slavery. He had, of course, a general objection to reform of any kind, but his objection to any reform which threatened the endurance of the slave system must have been an article of faith with him. It was the fate of King William the Fourth to live in a reign of reforms, not one of which would appear to have touched his heart or been in accordance with his personal judgment. The highest praise that history can give him is that he did not, at least, as one of his predecessors had done, set his own judgment and his own inclination determinedly and irrevocably against the advice of the statesmen whom he had called in to carry on the work of administration. The king gave his assent to the amended bill for the abolition of slavery, including the generous gift to the planters, and the measure became law on August 27, 1833. Some of the colonies had the sense and spirit to discard the apprenticeship system altogether and to date the emancipation of their slaves from the day when the measure became an act of Parliament. In no colony did the setting free of the Negroes bring about any of the troubles and turmoils, the lawless outbreaks of blacks against whites, the massacres of the innocents, 
which had been so long and so often pictured as the inevitable consequences of the legislation demanded by the Clarksons, the Wilberforces, the Buxtons, and the Brougham's. It seems to us all now so much a matter of course for a civilized and enlightened state to decree the extinction of slavery within its limits that we find it hard to appreciate at its true value the difficulty and the splendor of the achievement which was accomplished by the Gray Ministry. It has to be said, however, that the Ministry and the Parliament were in this instance only the instruments by which the great change was wrought. The movement carried on out of doors, the movement set going by the leading abolitionists and supported by the people, deserves the chief honor of the victory. All the countries that make up the kingdom, England, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales, sent their authorized speakers to sustain the cause of freedom for the slaves. The gift which, on the recommendation of Lord Grey's ministry, was placed at the disposal of the West Indian planters was indeed a lavish gift, but the public in general made little complaint on the score of its lavishness, and did not calculate too jealously the value of the sacrifice which the state was invited to make for the purchase of Negro emancipation. Thirty years and more had to pass before the great American Republic was able to free itself from the curse of slavery, and even then the late deliverance was only accomplished at the cost of a war which threatened, for the season, a permanent division of the states. The same year which saw the passing of the measure for the abolition of slavery in the colonies saw also the passing of an act which interfered seriously for the first time with something which might almost be called a system of domestic slavery. We are speaking now of the measure which dealt with the conditions of factory labor in these countries. Factory labor, as it was known in the early days of William the Fourth, was the growth of modern civilization. England had found that her main business in life was not the conquest and the subjection of foreign races, or the building or the navigating of ships, or the cultivation of land, or the growth of corn, but the manufacture of goods for her own domestic use and for export all over the world. Great manufacturing cities and towns were growing up everywhere, and while the workers on the land were becoming fewer and fewer, the workers in the city factories were multiplying every day so that an entirely new laboring population was coming up to claim the attention of the state. Since the old days, when the whole social organization was conducted according to the dictates of some centralized authority, there had been growing up as one of the inevitable reactions which civilization brings with it at its successive stages a sort of vaguely expressed doctrine that the state has no right to interfere between capital and labor, between the employer and the employed. This theory naturally grew and grew with the growth of the capital invested in manufactures and the increase in the number of employers, and it was found in later years than those at which we have now arrived that the course of agitation that Lord Ashley may be said to have begun was opposed mainly in its progress by the capitalists and the employers of labor, many of whom were thoroughly humane men, anxious to do the very best they could for the health and comfort of those whom they employed, but who sincerely believed that the civil law had no right to interfere with them and those who worked for them, and that the civil law could do only harm and no good by its best-intentioned interference. The whole controversy has now been long settled, and it is a distinctly understood condition of our social system that the state has a right to interfere between employer and employed when the condition of things is such that the employed is not always able to protect himself. At the time when Lord Ashley started on his long and beneficent career, there was practically no law which regulated the hours and the conditions of labor in the great factories. The whole factory system, the modern factory system as we understand it, was then quite a new part of our social organization. The factory, with its little army of workers, men, women, and children, was managed according to the will and judgment of the owner, unless in the rare cases where the demand for labor far exceeded the supply. In most places, 
the supply exceeded the demand, and the master was therefore free to make any conditions he pleased with his workers. If the master were a humane man, a just man, or even a far-seeing man, he took care that those who worked for him should be fairly treated, and should not be compelled to work under conditions dangerous to their health and destructive of their comfort. But if he were a selfish man or a careless man, the workers were used merely as instruments of profit by him or by those immediately under him, and it did not matter how soon they were used up, for there could always be found numbers enough who were eager to take their places and were willing to undertake any task on any terms for the sake of securing a bare living. Lord Ashley raised the whole question in the House of Commons and brought forward a motion which ended in the appointment of a commission to inquire into the condition of the men, women, and children who worked in the factories. The commission was not long in collecting a vast amount of information as to the evils, moral and physical, brought about by the overworking of women and children in the factories. The general concurrence of public opinion, even among those who supported Lord Ashley's movement, did not seem to go beyond the protection of women and children. The adult male, it was considered, might perhaps safely be left to make the best terms he could for himself. But the inquiries of the Commission left little doubt among unprejudiced minds that something must be done to secure women and children from the evils of overwork. Lord Ashley succeeded in forcing the whole question on the attention of Parliament, and an act was passed in 1833, which did not indeed go nearly as far as Lord Ashley would have carried his principle, but at least established the right of legislative interference for the protection of children and young persons of both sexes. The act limited the work of children to eight hours a day, and that of young persons under 18 to 69 hours a week. This act may be regarded as the beginning of that legislative interference which has gone on advancing beneficially from that time down to our own, and is likely still to keep on its forward movement. Lord Ashley, whom many of us can well remember as Lord Shrapsbury, may be said to have given up the whole of his life to the general purpose with which he began his public career, the object of endeavoring to mitigate the toils and sufferings of those who have to work hard in order to provide for others the comforts and the luxuries of life. His principle was that the state has always a right to interfere for the protection of those who cannot protect themselves. He was not a man of great statesmanlike ability. He was not a man of extensive or varied information. He was not a scholar. He was not an orator. He was not, in the ordinary sense of the word, a thinker. But he was a man who had, by a kind of philanthropic instinct, got hold of an idea which men of far greater intellect had not, up to his time, shown themselves able to grasp. The story of his life is part of the whole story of the industrial development of modern civilization. Again and again he worked with success in movement after movement, initiated mainly by himself, for the protection and the education of those who toil in our factories and in our mines. Some day, no doubt, Parliament may have to devise legislation which shall do for the women and children employed in field labor something like that which Lord Ashley did for the women and children employed in factories and in mines. We have seen that already efforts are made in every session of Parliament to extend the principle of the factory legislation into various industrial occupations which are common to city life. For the present, however, we have only to deal with the fact that one of the first labors accomplished by the reformed Parliament was the establishment of that legislative principle with which Lord Ashley's name will always be associated. Let it be added that, with the establishment of that principle, came also the introduction of two innovations in our factory system which lent inestimable value to the whole measure. One of these was the appointment of a number of factory inspectors who were authorized to see that the purposes of the act were properly carried out by the employers and to report to the government as to the working of the whole system 
and the necessity for further improvements. The other was the arrangement by which a portion of the time of all the younger workers in the factories was set apart for educational purposes, so that children should no longer be treated as mere machines for the making of goods and the earning of wages, but should be enabled and compelled to have their faculties developed by the instruction suitable to their years. This provision in the Factories Act may be regarded as the first step towards that system of national education which it took so much trouble and so many years to establish in these countries. Lord Ashley had great work still to accomplish, but even if his noble career had closed with the passing of the Factory Acts in 1833, his name would always be remembered as that of a man who, more than any other, helped to turn the first reformed parliament to the work of emancipating the English laboring classes in cities and towns from a servitude hardly less in conflict with the best interests of humanity than that which up to the same year had prevailed in the plantations of Jamaica and Demerara. The reformed parliament had still much difficult work to call out its best energies and to employ its new resources, but it had begun its tasks well and had already given the country good earnest of its splendid future. End of section 15《Section 16 of A History of the Four Georges and of William the Fourth, Volume 4, by Justin McCarthy and Justin Huntley McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 75 The State Church in Ireland. A saying which has been ascribed to a well known living Englishman who has made a name for himself in letters as well as in politics, may be used as the introduction to this chapter. The saying was that no man should ever be sent as chief secretary to the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland who could not prove that he had thoroughly mastered the meaning of the noble Irish poem rendered by Clarence Mangan as Dark Rosaline. The author and statesman to whom we refer used to point the moral of his observation sometimes by declaring that many or most of the political colleagues for whose benefit he had spoken had never heard either of Clarence Mangan or of Dark Rosaline. Now, as it is barely possible that some of the readers of this volume may be in a condition of similar ignorance, it is well to mention that Clarence Mangan was an Irish poet who was dear to the generation which saw the rise of the Young Ireland movement during O'Connell's later years, and that the dark Rosaline, whom Mangan found in the earlier poet's ballad, is supposed to typify his native country. The idea of the author and statesman was that no Englishman who had not studied this poem and got at the heart of its mystery so far as to be able to realize the deep poetic pathetic love of the Celtic heart for the soil, the traditions, and the ways of the Celtic island, could attempt with any success to undertake the government of the country. We have now come to a period in this history when the Irish question, as it is called, came up once again, and in a new form, to try the statesmanship of English rulers. We have told the story of 98, and how the rebellion ended in complete defeat and disaster. Up to the time at which we have now arrived, there was no more talk of rebellion in the field, but in the sullen heart of Irish discontent there still lived all the emotions which had animated Lord Edward Fitzgerald, Wolfe Tone, and Robert Emmet. When the rebellion was put down, the government of King George the Third abolished the Irish Parliament, and then all loyal and sensible persons in Westminster assumed, of course, that there was an end of the matter. The rebellion had been put down, the principal rebels had been done to death, Grattan's troublesome and tiresome parliament had been extinguished, 
Ireland had been merged into complete identification with England, and surely nothing would be heard of the Irish question any more. Yet the Irish question seemed to come up again and again, and to press for answer just as if answer enough had not been given already. There was a clamor about Catholic emancipation, and at last the Irish Catholics had to be emancipated from complete political disqualification, and their spokesman O'Connell had to be allowed to take his place in the House of Commons. Sir Robert Peel had carried Catholic emancipation, for although a Tory in many of his ways of thinking, he was a statesman and a man of genius, and now Lord Grey, the head of the Whig government, had no sooner passed the Reform Bill than he found himself confronted with the Irish question in a new shape. We could hardly wonder that Sir Robert Peel or Lord Grey did not try to inform their minds as to Irish national feeling through a study of Dark Rosaline, for the good reason that no such poem had yet been given to the world. But neither Peel nor Grey was a type of the average Englishman of the times, and each had gradually borne in upon him, by a study of realities if not of poetic fancies, that the national sentiment of the Irishman was not to be eradicated by any act of Parliament for his denationalization. Lord Grey, as the friend and pupil of Fox, who had always been the friend of Ireland, must have acquired, as a part of his early political training, the knowledge that Ireland's grievances were not all sentimental, and that if they were to be dealt with by acts of Parliament, these acts must take the part of relief and not of repression. It may well be questioned whether any population is disturbed for very long by mere sentimental grievances, and it may be doubted also whether the true instinct of statesmanship does not always regard the existence of what is called a sentimental grievance as the best reason for trying to find out whether there is not some practical evil at the root of the complaint. Certainly in Lord Grey's time the grievances were open and palpable enough to have attracted the attention of any man whose mind was not as well contented with the wisdom of his ancestors as that of King William himself. Just at this time, as we have seen, a school of Englishmen was springing up, Englishmen whose minds were filled with new ideas, and who thoroughly understood the tendencies of the reforming age to which they belonged. The Irish tithe question had come up for settlement. The Irish tithe question was only a part of the Irish state church question. The Irish state church was an institution bestowed upon Ireland by her conquerors. Five-sixths at least of the population of Ireland belonged to the Church of Rome, and were devoted to the religion of that church. The island was nevertheless compelled to maintain the Church of England, which did not even represent the religious belief of one-sixth of the population that was not Roman Catholic. One of the privileges of the state church was to extract tithes from all the farmers of the country for the maintenance of its clergy. Ireland, was almost altogether an agricultural country, and had but little to do with manufacturing industry, and in three out of the four provinces of Ireland, the farmers almost to a man held to the religion of their Catholic forefathers and worshipped only at the altars of their faith. It would be seen, therefore, that the imposition of tithes for the support of the state church ministers was not merely a sentimental grievance, but a very practical grievance as well. It was practical because it exacted the payment of a tribute which the farmer believed he ought not to be called upon to pay, and it was sentimental because while it extorted the money from the farmer's pocket, it also insulted his nationality and his faith. The result was that a sort of civil war was perpetually going on in Ireland between those who strove to collect the tithes and those from whom the tithes were to be collected. The resistance was sometimes of the fiercest character, 
the farmers and their friends resisted the forces sent by the government to seize the cattle of those who refused to pay as if they were resisting an army of foreign invaders blood was shed freely and lavishly in these struggles and the shedding of blood became so common that for a while it almost ceased to be a matter of public scandal sydney smith declared that the collection of tithes in ireland must have cost in all probability about one million of lives police infantry and dragoons were kept thus in constant occupation and yet it could not possibly be contended that those who claimed the tithes were very much the better for all the blood that was shed on their behalf for when a farmer's cattle had been seized by the police after an obstinate fight with the farmers and their friends and when the cattle had been driven off under the escort of infantry and cavalry soldiers the clergyman who claimed the tithes was not always any nearer to the getting of that which the law declared to be his own the familial proverbial saying about the ease with which a horse may be brought to the water and the difficulty there may be in getting him to drink when he has been brought there was illustrated aptly and oddly enough in the difference between seizure of the farmer's cattle and the means of raising any money on them when they had been seized the captured cattle could not in themselves be of much use to the clergymen who claimed the tithes and they would naturally have to be sold in order that he might get his due and the question arose who was to bid for them all the farmers and the peasantry of the country were on the one side and on the other side were the incumbent a few of his friends and the military and police it was certain that the soldiers and the policemen would not bid for the cattle and probably could not pay for them and the population of the district would have made the place very uncomfortable for any of the clergyman's friends who showed an anxiety to buy up the impounded beasts in some cases when cattle were sold by public auction no bidder ventured to come forward but the farmer himself who owned the cattle, and they had to be knocked down to him at a purely nominal price because there was no possible competitor. The farmer drove home his beasts amid the exaltation of the whole neighborhood, and the clergyman was as far off as tithes as ever. The passive resistance, in fact, was harder to deal with as far as practical results went than even the resistance that was active summoned together by lawful authority a number of soldiers and police and it is easy to shoot down a few unarmed peasants and to dispose for the hour of popular resistance in this prompt and peremptory way but what is to be done when the resistance takes the form of a resolute organized refusal to pay up the amounts claimed or to offer any price for the cattle seized in default of payment there were in every district numbers of quiet Catholic parishioners who would much rather have paid their share of the tithes to the Protestant clergymen than become drawn into quarrels and local disturbances and confusion. But such men soon found that if they paid their tithes, they put themselves in direct antagonism to the whole mass of their Catholic neighbors. Intimidation of the most serious kind was sometimes brought to bear upon them, and in any case there was that very powerful kind of intimidation which consists in making the offender feel that he has brought on himself the contempt and the hatred of nearly all his fellow parishioners and his fellow religionists. In those days it was not lawful to hold a public political meeting in Ireland but there were anti-tithe demonstrations got up nevertheless over three parts of ireland these demonstrations took the outward form of what were called hurling matches great rivalries of combatants in a peculiar irish game of ball each of these demonstrations was made to be and was known to be a practical protest against the collection of the tithes whenever it became certain that the recusant farmer's cattle were to be seized, a great hurling match was announced to be held in the immediate vicinity, 
and the local magistrates, who perhaps had at their disposal only a few handfuls of police or soldiery, were not much inclined to order the seizure in the presence of such a cloud of witnesses. Nor would any Catholic parishioner, who had quietly paid up his tithes without resistance, have felt very comfortable if he had happened to come near the hurling field that day and to hear the loudly expressed comments of his neighbors on his line of conduct. To make the trouble still deeper, it often happened that the claimant of the tithes was an absentee. The incumbent of many a parish in Ireland left his curate to look after his flock and his tithes alike, and the absentee was almost as much hated in Ireland as the tithe collector. Now, it must not be supposed that there were not many of the Protestant clergy in Ireland who utterly disapproved of the tithe system. One Protestant clergyman in England, from whom we have just quoted the Reverend Sidney Smith, had denounced the system over and over again in language the most indignant and the most scornful that even his scathing humor could command. But there were numbers of Protestant clergymen in Ireland who saw and proclaimed its injustice and its futility. The Archbishop of Dublin declared that no government could ever accomplish the collection of tithes in Ireland otherwise than at the point of the bayonet. Protestant country clergy often found that the very attempts to collect the tithes only brought increased distress and hardship upon themselves. Many a poor Protestant clergyman saw the utter injustice of the system and disliked and detested it almost as much as the Roman Catholics themselves could have done. There were many such men, too, who put up with miserable poverty rather than make any attempt to recover such an income by force. Great English speakers and writers were beginning to denounce the whole system. Macaulay stigmatized it as severely as Sidney Smith had done. George Grote, the historian of Greece, who had then a seat in the House of Commons, had not only condemned it, but had condemned the whole state church system of which it was only a part. In our own days, the ordinary English reader finds it hard to understand how any such system could have been carried on under a civilized European government. Such a reader will readily admit that Sidney Smith had not gone beyond the limits of sober assertion when he declared that there is no abuse like it in all Europe, in all Asia, in all the discovered parts of Africa, and in all we have ever heard of, Timbuktu. The subject had been brought up in Parliament by some of the advanced reformers of the day, and indeed it was bringing itself before the notice of Parliament every week through the official reports of the disturbances which were taking place in various parts of Ireland. The House of Lords had appointed a committee to inquire into the whole subject. The committee reported that a complete extinction of the tithe system was demanded, not only in the interests of Ireland, but in the interests of the state church itself, and suggested as a means of getting out of the difficulty that the tithes might be commuted for a charge upon land or by an exchange for an investment in land. This meant, in other words, that the collection of tithes should be devolved upon the landlord, leaving him to repay himself by a corresponding addition to the rent which he asked from his tenants. The House of Commons also appointed a committee to inquire into the subject, and the recommendation of that committee was in substance very much the same as the recommendation made by the committee appointed by the House of Lords. The government then took up the question, and in 1832 Lord Altrip announced that it was the intention of ministers to submit to the House of Commons a scheme of their own as a temporary settlement of the Irish tithe question, and out of which was to be developed in time a measure for the complete removal of the difficulty. A very brief description will serve to explain the nature of this measure. The government proposed to advance a certain sum of money for the relief of the tithe owners who had not been able to recover what the law held to be their due, 
and in the meantime to apply themselves to the preparation of some scheme which might transfer the tithe burden from the occupiers to the owners of the land. The government thus admitted that at the moment they did not see their way altogether out of the tithe difficulty, but promised to apply their minds to the discovery of some final and satisfactory settlement, and undertook until then to pay to incumbents the arrears of tithes and to collect the money as well as they could from the indebted occupiers. In point of fact, Lord Altrip and his colleagues proposed to become the tithe collectors themselves and to let any loss that might be incurred fall for the time upon the state and the national taxpayers. The plan was tried for a while, and we need hardly say that it proved altogether unsatisfactory. The government had no better means of compelling the farmers to pay the tithes than those means which they had already vainly put at the disposal of the tithe owners. The farmer, who could not be coerced by the police and the military into settling his accounts with the incumbent, was not likely to be any more ready to pay up because the demand for payment was made by the Lord Lieutenant. It was becoming more and more evident every day that the whole condition of the State Church in Ireland were responsible for the trouble of which the tithe's difficulty was only an incident. Already a party was forming itself in the House of Commons composed of intellectual and far-seeing men who recognized the fact that the Irish State Church was in its very principles an anomaly and an anachronism. On May 27, 1834, a debate on the whole question of the Irish State Church and its revenues was raised in the House of Commons by Mr. Henry Ward, one of the most advanced reformers and thoughtful politicians whom the new conditions of the franchise had brought into Parliament. Henry Ward was a son of that plumber Ward who was at one time famous as the author of a novel called Tremaine. If any memory of Tremaine lingers in the minds of readers who belong to the present generation, the lingering recollection is probably only due to the fact that in Disraeli's Vivian Grey there is an amusing scene in which the hero makes audacious use of an extemporized passage which he professes to find in Plummer Ward's novel. Henry Ward, the son, afterwards won some distinction by his administration of the Ionian Islands while the islands were under the charge of Great Britain. In our parliamentary history, however, he will always be remembered as the author of the first serious attempt to obtain a national recognition of the principle which within our times secured its final acknowledgment by the disestablishment of the Irish Church. The resolution which was proposed merely declared that the Protestant Episcopal establishment in Ireland exceeded the wants of the Protestant population and that it being the right of the state to regulate the distribution of church property in such manner as Parliament might determine, it was the opinion of the House that the temporal possessions of the state church in Ireland ought to be reduced. This resolution went no further in words, as it will be seen, than to ask for a reduction of the revenues of that church on the ground that it had already more funds than were required for the full discharge of its duties among those who attended its ministrations. But then the resolution also assumed the right of the state to institute an inquiry into the application of the revenues and the needs of the surrounding population, and would necessarily carry with it the assertion of the principle that the Irish state church existed only to minister to the wants of the Protestants of Ireland. It is clear that if once this principle were recognized by the state, the whole theory of the established church in Ireland could no longer be maintained. The theory was that the state had a right to uphold and a duty to perform in the maintenance of a Protestant establishment in Ireland for the purpose of converting to its doctrines the vast majority of the Irish population who could not be driven, even at the bayonet's point, to attend the services conducted by a Protestant pastor. Only a few years after this time, the great statesman who was afterwards to obtain from Parliament the disestablishment of the Irish Church was arguing in his earliest published work 
that the fewer the Protestants in Ireland, the greater was the necessity for the state to be lavish of its money with the object of converting the outer population to the established religion. Mr. Ward, in his speech, set himself to make it clear to the House of Commons that the collection of tithes in Ireland was at that time the principal cause of the disturbance and disaffection which brought so much calamity on the unhappy island and prevented any possibility of its becoming a loyal part of the British dominions. He showed by facts and figures that the opposition to the collection of tithes was not any longer confined to the Catholic population alone, but had spread among the Protestants of dissenting denominations and was showing itself in the north of Ireland as well as in the provinces of the south and the west and the midlands. He pointed to the fact that it was found necessary to maintain in Ireland for the purpose of collecting the tithes an army larger than that which England needed for the maintenance of her Indian empire, and that nevertheless it was found impossible to collect the tithes in Ireland, and that the government could suggest nothing better than a project for the payment of the tithes out of the pockets of the national taxpayer. Mr. Ward made it clear to the House of Commons that the revenues of the state church in Ireland were not distributed with anything like a view to the fair and equal remuneration of its clergy. In numbers of cases, the clergy of the higher ranks had enormous incomes, quite out of all proportion to any duties they were supposed to perform, while the clergymen who actually did the work were, as a general rule, screwed down to a pitiful rate of payment which hardly kept soul and body together. Twenty pounds a year was not an uncommon stipend among the curates who did the hard work, while an annual revenue of sixty pounds was regarded as something like opulence. Where the curate received his thirty or forty pounds a year or less, the incumbent usually had his two thousand a year, and in many instances much more. As we said before, the incumbent deriving a rich revenue from his office was often habitually an absentee who left the whole of his work to be performed as best it might be done by the curate half starving on a miserable pittance mr ward made out a case which must have produced some impression on any parliamentary assembly and could hardly fail to find attentive listeners and ready sympathy among the members of the first reformed house of commons the motion was seconded by a remarkable man in a remarkable speech. Mr. George Grote, afterwards famous as the historian of Greece, was one of the new members of Parliament. He was a man of a peculiar type, of an intellectual order which we do not usually associate with the movement of the political world, but which is nevertheless seldom without its representative in the House of Commons. Grote was one of the small group of men who were at that time described as philosophical radicals. He acknowledged the influence of Bentham. He was a friend and associate of the elder and the younger Mill. He was a banker by occupation, a scholar and an author by vocation, a member of Parliament from a sense of duty. Grote, no doubt, was sometimes mistaken in the political conclusions at which he arrived, but he deserved the praise which Macaulay has justly given to Burke that he was always right in his point of view. With Grote, a political measure was right or wrong only as it helped or hindered the spread of education, human happiness, and peace. He was one of the earliest and most persevering advocates of the ballot system at elections, and during his short parliamentary career he made the ballot the subject of an annual motion. Some of us can still well remember George Grote in his much later days and can bear testimony to the fact that, to quote the thrilling words of Schiller, he reverenced in his manhood the dreams of his youth. We can remember how steady an opponent he was of slavery and how his sympathies went with the cause of the North during the great American Civil War. One can hardly suppose that Grote's style as a speaker was well suited to the ways of the House of Commons, but it is certain that whenever he spoke, he always made a distinct impression on the House. Some of us who can remember John Stuart Mill addressing that same assembly at a later day can probably form an idea 
of the influence exercised on the house by the man who seemed to be thinking his thoughts aloud rather than trying to win over votes or to catch encouraging applause Grote's speech on Ward's motion brought up one view of the Irish Church which especially deserved consideration. Grote dealt with the alarms and the convictions of those who were insisting that to acknowledge any right of Parliament to interfere with the Irish State Church would be to sound in advance the doom of the English State Church as well. He pointed out that whatever difference of opinion there might be, as to the general principle of a state establishment, the case of the two churches, the English and the Irish, must be argued upon grounds which had nothing in common. Every argument which could be used and must be used for the State Church of England was an argument against the State Church in Ireland. The State Church of England was the church to which the vast majority of the English people belonged. It ministered to their spiritual needs. It was associated with their ways, their hopes, their past, and their future. If an overwhelming majority in any country could claim the right, by virtue of their majority, to set up and maintain any institution, the Protestant population of England could claim a right to set up a state church. But every word that could be said in support of the English state church was a word of condemnation and of sentence on the state church in Ireland. The Irish state church was the church of so small a minority that when allowance had been made for the numbers of dissenting Protestants in Ireland, it was doubtful whether one in every twelve of the whole population could be claimed as a worshipper in the temples maintained and endowed by law. Moreover, the Irish state church was a badge of conquest and was regarded as such by the whole Celtic population of the island. The tithe exacted from the Irish Catholic farmer was not merely a tribute exacted by the conqueror, but was also a brand of degradation on the faith and on the nationality of the Irish Celt who was called upon to meet the demand. The student of history will note with some interest that at a day much nearer to our own, the Lord Stanley, whose name we shall presently have to bring up in connection with this debate on Mr. Ward's motion, made use in the House of Lords of an appeal which suggested the idea that he had not heard or had forgotten George Grote's speech on which we have just been making comment. Not very long before his death, Lord Derby, as he had then become, was declaiming in the House of Lords against the proposal to disestablish the Irish State Church, and he warned the House that if the fabric of the Irish Church were to be touched by a destroying hand, it would be in vain to hope that the destruction of the English State Church could long be averted. Lord Derby had always a very happy gift of quotation, and he made on this occasion a striking allusion. He reminded the house of that thrilling scene in Scott's Guy Mannering, where the gypsy woman suddenly presents herself on the roadside to the elder, the laird of Ellangowan, and some of his friends, and complaining of the eviction of her own people from their homesteads, bids the gentlefolk take care that their own rooftops are not put in danger by what they had done. Lord Derby made use of this passage as a warning to the prelates and peers of England that if they allowed the Irish state church to be disestablished, the statelier fabric of their own church in England might suffer by the example. It was pointed out at the time by some of those who commented on Lord Derby's speech that George Grote had answered this argument by unconscious anticipation and had shown that the best security of the Irish state church was the fact that it rested on a foundation totally different from that of the State Church of Ireland. The government was greatly embarrassed by all this discussion as to the condition, the work, and the character of the establishment in Ireland. Lord Grey, whose whole nature inclined him to move along the path of progress with slow, steady, and stately steps, began to chafe against the eagerness with which the more radical reformers were endeavoring to hurry on the political movement. It was necessary that the government should announce a purpose of one kind or another, should either give a general sanction to the inquiry into the claims and merits of the Irish Church, or declare themselves against any movement of reform in that direction. 
it was found hardly possible for the government to ally themselves with the followers of old-fashioned Toryism, and it soon began to be rumored that Lord Grey could only keep on the reforming path at the cost of losing some of his most capable colleagues. Before long it was made publicly known that the rumors were well founded. Lord Stanley and Sir James Graham resigned their places in the ministry. Graham afterwards held office in more than one administration that might well be called liberal, but Lord Stanley passed the greater part of his parliamentary life in the ranks of uncompromising Toryism. He had begun his public career as an enthusiastic champion of parliamentary reform, and he was the figurehead of reform again at a much later date, but on all other questions he remained a steadfast and a most eloquent advocate of genuine Tory principles. It may fittingly be mentioned here that the existence of the Radical Party, recognized as such and regarded as distinct from the ordinary Liberals, began with the debates on the State Church in Ireland. The passing of the Reform Bill divided the Whigs and Tories into Liberals and Conservatives, and the discussion on the Irish Church divided those who had once been Whigs into Liberals and Radicals. Meanwhile, poor old King William was greatly concerned by the attacks which had been made upon the State Church in Ireland. William the Fourth had a simple sort of piety of his own, and was perhaps somewhat like the man whom Dr. Johnson commended because whatever follies or offenses he might have committed, he never passed a church without taking off his hat. The king knew little or nothing we may suppose about the Irish church and the way in which it was fulfilled or had any chance of fulfilling its sacred office, but he took off his hat to it as a church and more than that, he shed tears and positively blubbered over its hard fate in having to stand so many attacks from its enemies. The king received on one of his birthdays a delegation from the prelates of the Irish church, and to them he poured out his assurances that nothing should ever induce him to abandon that church to its ungodly foes. He reminded the prelates that he was growing an old man, that his departure from this world must be near at hand, that he had nothing left to live for but the rightful discharge of his duties as a Protestant sovereign, and he bade them to believe that the tears which were bedewing his countenance were the tears of heartfelt sympathy and sorrow. The king, nevertheless, did not get into any quarrel with his ministers on the subject of the Irish Church, and when any documents bearing on the question were presented to him for signature, he ended by affixing his name and did not allow his tears to fall upon it and blot it out. The Duke of Cumberland, too, stood by the Irish Church to the best of his power. A member of the House of Lords has a privilege which is not accorded to a member of the House of Commons. He can enter on the books of the House his written protest against the passing of any measure which he has not been able to keep out of legislation. The Duke of Cumberland entered his protest against some of the resolutions taken with regard to the Irish State Church, and he declared that the sovereign who affirmed such resolves must do so in defiance of the coronation oath. That coronation oath had not been brought into much prominence since the days of George the Third, when it used to be relied upon as an impassable barrier to many a great measure of political justice and mercy. The Duke of Cumberland was not exactly the sort of man who could quicken it anew into an animating influence, and King William did what his ministers advised him to do, and the world went on its way. The king, however, liked his ministers, none the more because he did not see his way to quarrel with them when they advised him to make some concessions to public feeling on the subject of the Irish tithes. Thus far, indeed, the concessions were not very great, and the important fact for this part of our history is only that the tithe question brought up the far more momentous question which called into doubt the right to existence of the Irish State Church itself. The government went no farther for the time than to offer the appointment of a commission to inquire into the incidents and the levying of the tithes, and endeavored to evade the question of appropriation that is, the question as to the right of Parliament 
to decide the manner in which the revenues of the Irish State Church ought to be employed. The tithe question itself was finally settled for England before it came to be finally settled for Ireland. But its settlement involved no such consequences to the English State Church as it did to the State Church in Ireland. For our present purposes, it is enough to record the fact that the earliest clear indications of the national policy, which in a later generation disestablished the Irish State Church, were given by the first Reform Parliament. Meanwhile, the controversy raised as to the position of the Irish establishment had had the effect of disturbing Lord Grey, who did not like to be driven too rapidly along the path of reform, of greatly angering the sovereign, who grumbled all the more because he could not openly resist, and of dissatisfying men like Ward and Grote and Lord Durham, and even members of the cabinet, like Lord John Russell, who could not regard mere slowness as a virtue when there was an obvious wrong to be redressed. End of section 16. Section 17 of A History of the Four Georges and of William the Fourth, Volume 4, by Justin McCarthy and Justin Huntley McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 76. Only a Pauper. The spirit of reform was impelling Lord Grey's government in other directions, as well as in those which led to the abolition of slavery in the colonies. The improved conditions of the factory works and the introduction of some better method for the collecting of tithes. The state of the poor laws all over the country had long been attracting the attention of thoughtful, philanthropic, and at the same time practical men. The administration of relief to the poor was still conducted up to Lord Grey's reforming administration, on the same general principle as that which had been embodied in the famous statute of Queen Elizabeth. The manner in which that principle had been working during the intervening centuries was only another illustration of Burke's maxim about systems founded on the heroic virtues, to which we have lately made reference in this volume. The statute of Elizabeth was based on the principle that the state, or at least the local authorities, ought to find relief for the deserving poor. The duty of making provision for the deserving poor was left in the hands of those who managed the affairs of the parishes, of whom the local clergy and magistrates were the principal personages. The means had to be furnished by the taxpayers, and the influential men of each parish were left to decide as to the claims and the deserts of the applicants. There was no regular body answerable to public opinion, nor was there, indeed, any practical way in which the public of a district could very effectively express itself. Nothing could be better arranged for the development of that benevolent spirit which Sidney Smith describes as common to all humanity, and under the influence of which no sooner does A hear that B is in distress than he thinks C ought at once to relieve him. Men and women had only to go and say that they were in distress, and some influential persons in the neighborhood were sure to find that the easiest way of doing a benevolent act was to provide them with orders for parochial relief inside or outside the workhouse. There seemed to be a sort of easy-going impression, prevailing everywhere, that when a man or woman or a family had once been set down for relief from the rates, the enrollment ought to endure as a kind of property for life and even as an inheritance for future generations. The grant of parish relief under the old ways has been humorously likened to a state pension, which when it has once been given is never supposed to be revoked during the lifetime of the privileged pensioner. But the presumption in the case of those relieved by the parish had a still more abiding efficacy for it was assumed that if a man got parish relief for himself and his family, the beneficent endowment was to pass onward from generation to generation. It is quite certain that whole races of paupers began to grow up in the country, one family, depending on the rates, engendering another family, 
who were likewise to be dependent on the rates. Thus the vice of lazy and shiftless poverty was bequeathed from pauper sire to son. In the case of the ordinary man or woman, there was no incitement to industry and perseverance. The idle pauper would be fed in any case, and no matter how hard he worked at the ordinary labor within his reach, he could only hope to be poorly fed. Indeed, even the man who had an honest inclination for honest labor was very much in the condition of the Irish cottier tenant, described many years afterwards by John Stuart Mill as one who could neither benefit by his industry nor suffer by his improvidence. The system may be said without exaggeration to have put a positive premium on immorality among the poorer class of women in a district, for an unmarried girl who had pauper offspring to show was sure to receive the liberal benefit of parochial relief. Pity was easily aroused for her youth, her fall, her deserted condition when her lover or betrayer had taken himself off to some other district. Any tale of deceived innocence was readily believed, and so far as physical comforts go, the unmarried mother was generally better off than the poor, toiling, and virtuous wife of the hard-working laborer who found her family growing and her husband's wages without any increase. Then, of course, there was all manner of jobbery and a certain kind of corruption among parish officials and the local tradesmen and employers of labor generally, which grew to be an almost recognized incident of the local institutions. Labor could be got on cheaper terms than the ordinary market rates if the employers could have men or women at certain seasons of the year whom the parish was willing to maintain in idleness for the rest of the time. Small contracts of all kinds were commonly made, in this sort of fashion, between parish officials and local employers, and the whole system of relief seemed to become converted into a corrupting influence, pervading the social life, and showing its effects in idleness, immorality, and an infectious disease of pauperism. Owing to the many misinterpretations of the laws of settlement, it was often easy for a rich and populous district to fling much of its floating pauperism on some poorer region, and thus it frequently happened that the more poverty-stricken the parish, the greater was the proportion of unsettled pauperism for which it had to provide. In many districts, the poorer classes of ratepayers were scarcely a degree better off than the actual paupers whom they were taxed to support. Thus, many a struggling family became pauperized in the end because of the increase in the rates which the head of the family could no longer pay, and the exhausted breadwinner, having done his best to keep himself and his family independent, had at last to eat the bread of idleness from parish relief or to starve with his family by the roadside. Things had come to such a pass, indeed, that many earnest and capable observers like Lord Brougham, Mr. Nassau Sr., and Miss Martineau were beginning to advocate the doctrine that no remedy could be found for the system of legalized poor relief short of its total abolition. It was gravely contended by many reformers, whose guiding spirit was pure love of humanity, that the best course for the government to take would be to abolish the poor relief system altogether and leave the really deserving poor to the mercy of private benevolence. By such a measure it was contended, private charity would be left to find out its own, and would before long find out its own, and the charity thus given would carry with it no demoralizing effect, but would be bestowed, as all true charity is bestowed, with the object of enabling those whom it helped to help themselves after a while. The owner of an estate, it was argued, can easily find out where there is genuine distress among those who depend upon him, and can sustain them through their time of need, so that when their hour of sickness or enforced idleness is over, they may be able to begin again with renewed energy, and work with the honest purpose of making themselves independent. It was urged that the operation of the legalized poor law relief could only create new pauperism wherever its unwholesome touch was felt, it would impress on the well-inclined and the industrious the futility of honest and persevering endeavor, inasmuch as idleness could get itself better cared for than laborious poverty. 
idleness and immorality, it was argued, were well housed and fed, while honest independence and virtue were left outside in cold and hunger. The study of political economy was even already beginning to be a part of the education of most men who took any guiding place or even any observant interest in the national life. Writers who dealt with such subjects were beginning to find readers among the general public. Some of the members of Lord Grey's own administration had taken a close interest in such questions. The whole subject of poor relief and its distribution was one of the earliest which came under the consideration of the Liberal government after the passing of the Reform Bill. It was clear that something would soon have to be done, and as the Whig ministers had a good deal of other work on their hands, the natural course at such a time was to appoint a commission which should inquire into the whole system of poor law relief and report to the government as to the best means for its reorganization. Such a commission was appointed and set at once to its work. Among the commissioners and the assistant commissioners nominated for the purpose were some men whose names are well remembered in our own days. One of those was Mr. Nassau Sr., a man of great ability and wide practical information, who distinguished himself in many other fields of literary work, as well as that which belonged to what may be called the literature of pure economics. Another was Mr. Edwin, afterwards Sir Edwin Chadwick, who was a living and an active presence until a very short time ago, among those who devoted themselves to the study and the propagation of what are called social science principles, and whose work was highly valued by so well qualified a critic as John Stuart Mill. The Commission made careful inquiry into the operation of the poor law relief system and presented a report which marked an epoch in our social history and might well have a deep interest even for the casual student of today. The result of the inquiries made was such as to satisfy the commissioners that the administration of the poor law had increased the evils of pauperism, wherever it found them already in existence, and had created and fostered evils of the same kind, even in regions which had not known them before they were touched by its contagion. The report of the commissioners pronounced that the existing system of poor law was destructive to the industry and honesty and forethought of the laborers, to the wealth and morality of the employers of labor and the owners of property, and to the mutual goodwill and happiness of all. This may be thought a very sweeping condemnation, but the more closely the evidence is studied, the more clearly it will be seen that where the poor relief system had any effect worth taking into calculation, this was the sort of effect it produced. The real objects of the legalized poor law reform system were well and even liberally described in the report of the commissioners. The object of poor relief, as the commissioners defined it, should be to make provision for that proportion to be found in almost every community which is plunged into such a condition of distress that it never can hope to be self-supporting again, and for that more fluctuating proportion made up of those who at the time are unable to support themselves, but whom some temporary relief may enable to return to their former condition of independence. In each class of cases, it ought to be made equally clear before public relief were called in that those in distress, continuous or temporary, had no near relatives in a condition to afford them reasonable assistance without undue sacrifice. Of course, it was understood that these conditions included the men and women who, owing to some temporary lack of employment, were actually unable to find the means of living by their own honest labor. The ideas of the commissioners were not pedantically economical in their range, nor did they insist that public relief must be given only as the reward of personal integrity when visited by undeserved misfortune. It was freely admitted that even where men and women had allowed themselves by idleness or carelessness to sink into actual poverty, it was better to give them temporary relief at the public expense than allow them to take up with the ways of crime or leave them to pay the penalty of their wrongdoings by death from starvation. But it was strictly laid down that a healthy system of public relief was to help men and women for a time, in order that they might be able to help themselves once again as soon as possible, 
and to make provision for those who had done their work and could do no more and who had no near relatives in a condition to help them from starvation the report of the commissioners pointed out that the existing system collects and chains down the laborers in masses without any reference to the demand for their labor that while it increases their numbers it impairs the means by which the fund of their subsistence is to be reproduced and impairs the motives for using those means which it suffers to exist and that every year and every day these evils are becoming more overwhelming in magnitude and less susceptible of cure the passages which we have quoted are taken from the recommendations of mr chadwick he goes on to say that of those evils that which consists merely in the amount of the rates an evil great when considered by itself but trifling when compared with the moral effects which i am deploring might be much diminished by the combination of workhouses and by substituting a rigid administration and contract management for the existing scenes of neglect extravagance jobbery and fraud mr chadwick points out that if no relief were allowed to be given to the able-bodied or to their families except in return for adequate labor or in a well-regulated workhouse the worst of the existing sources of evil the allowance system would immediately disappear a broad line would be drawn between the independent laborers and the paupers the numbers of paupers would be immediately diminished in consequence of the reluctance to accept relief on such terms and would be still further diminished in consequence of the increased fund for the payment of wages occasioned by the diminution of rates and would ultimately instead of forming a constantly increasing proportion of our whole population become a small well-defined part of it capable of being provided for at expense less than one-half of the present poor rates and finally it was urged that it is essential to every one of these improvements that the administration of the poor laws should be entrusted as to their general superintendence to one central authority with extensive powers and as to their details to paid officers acting under the consciousness of constant superintendence and strict responsibility on these reports and recommendations the new measure for the reorganization of the poor law system was founded the main objects of the measure were to divide these countries for poor relief purposes into areas of regular and in a certain sense of equal proportions so that the whole burden of poverty should not be cast for relief on one particular district while a neighboring and much richer district was able to escape from its fair measure of liability to have the relief administered not by local justices or parish clergymen but by representative bodies duly elected and responsible to public opinion and by the creation of one great central board charged with the duty of seeing to the proper administration of the whole system thus it will be observed that the main principle of the reform bill the principle of representation had been already accepted by statesmanship as the central idea of a department of state which had nothing to do with the struggles of political parties. The measure, when it came before the Parliament, met, of course, with strong opposition, first in the House of Commons, and then in the House of Lords. Much of the opposition came, no doubt, from men of old-fashioned ways who dreaded and hated any changes in any institutions to which they had been accustomed, and who held that even pauperism itself acquired a certain sanctity, from the fact that it had been fostered and encouraged by the wisdom of so many succeeding generations. Some of the opposition, however, was inspired by feelings of more purely sentimental, and therefore perhaps of a more respectable order. It was urged that the new system of carried into law would bear hardly on the deserving as well as the undeserving poor, that the workhouse test would separate the husband from wife, and the father from the children, and above all, that certain clauses of the new measure would leave the once innocent girl who had been led astray by some vile tempter to bear the whole legal responsibility as well as the public shame of her sin it is not necessary for us now to go over at any length the long arguments which were brought up on both sides of the controversy many capable and high-minded observers were carried away by what may be called the sentimental side of the question and forgot the enormous extent of the almost national corruption which the measure was striving to remove 
in their repugnance to some of the evils which it did not indeed create, but which it failed to abolish. One weakness common to nearly all the arguments employed against the measure came from the facility there was for putting out of sight altogether during such a process of reasoning the fact that the daily and hourly effect of the existing system was to force the deserving and hard-working poor to sink into that very pauperism which it was the object of all lawmakers to diminish or to abolish altogether. The wit of man could not devise any system of poor relief which should never go wrong in its application, should never bear harshly on men and women who deserved and were striving for an honest and independent subsistence. The bill, however, was passed in the House of Commons by a large majority. It was carried after a hard fight through the House of Lords and received the royal assent in August 1834. It should be said that the Duke of Wellington, although usually strong and resolute as a party man, had good sense and fair spirit enough to make him a warm supporter of the measure, despite the vehement protestations of many of his own habitual supporters. Since that time, it seems to be admitted by common consent that the measure has accomplished all the beneficial results which its promoters anticipated from it, and has in many of its provisions worked even better than some of its supporters had expected. Of course, our poor law system has since that time been always undergoing modifications of some kind or another, and public criticism is continually pointing to the necessity for further improvement. We hear every now and then of cases in which, owing to local maladministration, some deserving men and women, honestly struggling to keep their heads above pauperism, are left to perish of hunger or cold. We read well-authenticated, only too well-authenticated instances, of actual starvation taking place in some wealthy district of a great city. We hear of parochial funds squandered and muddled away, of the ratepayers' money wasted in extravagance, and worse than extravagance, of miserable courts and alleys where the deserving and undeserving poor are alike neglected and uncared for. But it would be utterly impossible that some such defects as these should not be found in the management of any system worked by human mechanism for such a purpose as the relief of a great nation's poverty. The predominant fact is that we have a system which is based on the representative principle which is open to the inspection and the criticism of the whole country, and which frankly declares itself the enemy of professional beggary and the helper of the poverty which is honestly striving to help itself. Much remains yet to be done for the improvement of our national system of poor relief, but it has at least to be said that the reformed Parliament did actually establish a system founded on just principles and responsible to public judgment. Another of the great reforms which was accomplished in this age of reform found its occasion when the time came for the renewal of the East India Company's charter. The government and the Houses of Parliament had to deal with the future administration of one of the great empires the world had ever seen, brought together by events and forces the like of which had not been at work in any previous chapter of the world's history. We have already traced in this book the growth of the East India Company's possessions, a growth brought about by a combination of the qualities which belonged to the Alexanders and the Caesars, and of the qualities also which go to the expansion of peaceful commerce and the opening up of markets for purely industrial enterprise. The charter of the company had been renewed by legislation at long intervals and the first reformed parliament now found itself compelled to settle the conditions under which the charter should be renewed for another period of twenty years. Mr. Molesworth justly remarks that it was a fortunate circumstance that the reform bill had passed, and a reform parliament been elected before the question of the renewal of the company's charter was decided, for otherwise the directors of this great company and other persons interested in the maintenance of the monopolies and abuses connected with it would in all probability have returned to Parliament by means of rotten boroughs, a party of adherents sufficiently large to have effectually prevented the government and the House of Commons from dealing with this great question in the manner in which the interests of England and India alike 
demanded that it should be dealt with. Up to the time at which we have now arrived, the East India Company had an almost absolute monopoly of the whole Chinese trade, as well as the Indian trade, and a control over the administration of India such as might well have gratified the ambition of a despotic monarch. The last renewal of the company's charter had been in 1813, and it was to run for twenty years, so that Lord Grey's government found themselves charged with the task of making arrangements for its continuance, or its modifications, or its abolition. Some distinction had already been effected between the powers of the company, as the ruler of a vast empire under the suzerainty of England, and its powers as a huge commercial corporation, or what we should now call a syndicate, but the company still retained its monopoly of the India and China trade. In the meantime, however, the principles of political economy had been asserting a growing influence over the public intelligence, and the question was coming to be asked more and more earnestly why a private company should be allowed the exclusive right of conducting the trade between England and India and China. An agitation against the monopoly began, as was but natural, among the great manufacturing and commercial towns in the north of England. Miss Martineau, in her History of the Thirty Years' Peace, ascribes the beginning of this movement to a well-known merchant and philanthropist of Liverpool, the late Mr. William Rathbone, whom some of us can still remember having known in our earlier years. Miss Martineau had probably good reasons for making such a statement, and in all events nothing is more likely than that such a movement began in Liverpool and began with such a man. In London, the directors and supporters of the East India Company were too powerful to give much chance to a hostile movement begun in the metropolis, and it needed the energy, the commercial independence, and the advanced opinions of the northern cities to give it an effective start. When the time came for the renewal of the company's charter, the government had made up their mind that the renewal should be conditional on the abolition of the commercial monopoly, and that the trade between the dominions of King William and the eastern populations should be thrown open to all the king's subjects. The measure passed through both houses of Parliament with but little opposition. Mr. Molesworth is perfectly right in his remarks as to the different sort of reception which would have been given to such a measure if the charter had come up for renewal before the act of reform had abolished the nomination boroughs and the various other sham constituencies. But it is a striking proof of the hold which the representative principle and the doctrines of free trade were already beginning to have on public opinion that the monopoly of the East India Company should not have been able to make a harder fight for its existence. The wonder which a modern reader will be likely to feel as he studies the subject now is not that the monopoly should have been abolished with so little trouble, but that rational men should have admitted so long the possibility of any justification for its existence. The renewal of the Charter of the Bank of England gave an opportunity during the same session for an alteration in the conditions under which the bank maintains its legalized position and its relations with the state, and for a further reorganization of those conditions which was in itself a distinct advance in the commercial arrangements of the empire. Other modifications have taken place from time to time since those days, and it is enough to say here that the alterations made by the first reformed parliament at the impulse of Lord Grey and his colleagues were in keeping with the movement of the commercial spirit and went along the path illumined by the growing light of a sound political economy. End of section 17 Section 18 of A History of the Four Georges and of William the Fourth, Volume 4 by Justin McCarthy and Justin Huntley McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 77, Peel's Forlorn Hope, Part 1. Lord Grey was growing tired of the work of that administration. It had been incessant work, and its great successes of later years had been checkered by some disappointments, which, although not deep-reaching, were irritating and disturbing. Some of his most capable colleagues had broken away from him, 
and he probably began to feel that the reformers all over the country expected more of him than he saw his way to accomplish. In 1834, he asked to be relieved from the duties of his office, and the king consented, probably with greater good will than he had felt in acceding to some of Lord Grey's previous requests, and accordingly Lord Grey ceased to be Prime Minister. With his resignation of office, Lord Grey passes out of this history and takes an abiding place in the parliamentary history of his country. He can hardly be called a great statesman, for he had been mainly instrumental in bringing to success and putting into legislative form the ideas of greater men. But his must be regarded as a distinguished and noble figure among England's parliamentary leaders. He was especially suited for the work which it was his proud fortune to accomplish at the zenith of his power, for no one could be better fitted than he for the task of discountenancing the wild alarms which were felt by so many belonging to what were called the privileged classes at the thought of any measures of reform which might disturb the existing order of things and lead to red ruin and the breaking up of laws. On Lord Grey's retirement, he was succeeded as Prime Minister by Lord Melbourne, who had previously been Home Secretary. Lord Melbourne might have been thought just the sort of person with whom King William could easily get on, because such a Prime Minister was not likely to vex his sovereign's unwilling ear by too many demands for rapid and far-reaching reform. Melbourne was a thoroughly easy, not to say lazy, man. He was certainly not wanting in intellect, he had some culture, he was a great reader of books and a great lover of books, and he was often only too glad to escape into literary talk and literary gossip from discussions on political questions and measures to be introduced into Parliament. He was fond of society, made himself generally agreeable to women, and was usually well acquainted with the passing scandals of high social life. One might indeed have thought that such a man was just the minister in whom King William would find a congenial companion and adviser, but the truth was that the king had grown tired of the Whig statesmen and had long been looking out for an opportunity to get rid of them on easy terms. Perhaps he did not quite like the idea of telling a man of Lord Grey's stately demeanor that he wished to dispense with his services and saw in Lord Melbourne a minister who could be approached on any subject without much sensation of awe. However that may be, the king soon found what seemed to him a satisfactory opportunity for ridding himself of the presence of his Whig advisers. Lord Altrip was suddenly raised to the House of Lords by the death of his father, Earl Spencer, and of course some rearrangement of the ministry became necessary, as it would not be possible that the Chancellor of the Exchequer should have a ministerial place anywhere but in the House, which has the levying of the taxes and the spending of the money. When Lord Melbourne came to advise with his sovereign on the subject, the king informed him in the most direct and off-hand manner that he contemplated a much more complete rearrangement than Lord Melbourne had suggested, and in fact that he had made up his mind to get rid of the present government altogether. Lord Melbourne, of course, bowed to the will of his master, and indeed was not the sort of man to take a dismissal from office greatly to heart, believing it, no doubt, quite likely that some restoration to office might await him, and possibly feeling that life had some enjoyments left for him, even though he was never again to be Prime Minister. The King determined to send for Sir Robert Peel and entrust him with the task of forming an administration. William had, as might naturally be expected of him, consulted in the first instance with the Duke of Wellington. Wellington, with the practical good sense which was a part of his character, had told the Sovereign that at such a time it was futile to think of calling upon any one to become Prime Minister who had not a seat in the House of Commons. As the King was resolved to have a new administration, Peel was obviously the man to be entrusted with the task of forming it, and therefore the King sent for him at once. But Peel was not in England. He had gone with his wife to Italy, and as we know from his own published letters, he had not entered into any communication even with the Duke of Wellington as to the probable movements of political affairs in his absence, not supposing for a moment that any emergency could arise at home 
which might make it necessary for him to cut short his holiday and return to the working ground of Westminster. A special messenger had to be sent off at once to convey to Peel the wishes of his sovereign, and one has to stop and think over things a little before he can quite realize what it meant in those days, which seem so near our own, to send a special message from London to the heart of Italy. Peel was at Rome, and had just returned with his wife one night from a great ball given by a celebrated Italian princess, when he received a letter which urged him to come back and become for the first time Prime Minister of England. Peel's mind was at once made up. That sense of duty which always guided his movements dictated his reply. There was for him no question of personal pride or ambition to be gratified, or of any graceful effort to affect the ways of one who modestly shrinks from a task beyond his power. He saw that his sovereign needed his immediate services, and that was enough for him. He and his wife were just on the eve of what had promised to be a delightful visit to Naples, but the visit to Naples was put off without a second thought to the indefinite future, and the statesman and his wife set out at once on their journey to London. The preparations for such a journey at that time were such as might give pause even to an experienced explorer in our own easy-going and luxurious age. Sir Robert Peel, of course, had to travel by private carriage. He had to traverse more than one state in order to reach the sea at Calais. The roads were dangerous in many places, and Peel had to take some well-armed servants with him. He had to go well provided with the most elaborate official passports. He had even to obtain a special passport for himself, lest in the event of his wife finding the constant travel too much for her, she might have to take rest at some town on the way, and Peel, if he attempted to continue his journey, might be stopped somewhere until he had satisfactorily accounted for the disappearance of the lady who was described in the original passports as his traveling companion and his wife. The journey was interrupted by unforeseen obstacles in several places. At one spot, the rising of a river relentlessly barricaded the progress of the travelers for many hours. At another point, a bridge was broken down. In France, Peel and his wife were brought to a stand at the city of Lyon because that city happened just then to be in a state of siege, and the travelers had to furnish satisfactory evidence that they were not emissaries of some revolutionary propaganda. It took twelve days to cover the distance from Rome to Dover, and except for such delays as have just been mentioned, our travelers had gone on night and day without stopping. Even when they arrived at Dover, Peel took no thought about rest, but journeyed on all night until he reached London. Peel himself tells us in his memoirs that the long travel had at least the advantage of giving him time enough to think out his course of action in the best way of serving his sovereign and country. The journey, he says, allowed him to do this coolly and without interruption. He certainly had time enough for the purpose, but it must have needed all Peel's strength of character to enable him to give his mind up to such considerations during a course so toilsome, so rugged, so dangerous, and often so rudely interrupted. He arrived in London at an early hour on the morning of December ninth, 1834, and he set off at once to present himself to the king, by whom it need hardly be said he was very cordially welcomed. The welcome became all the more warm because he was willing to accept the important task which the king desired to entrust to him, and would enter without delay on the work of endeavoring to form a ministry. Now, in order to do justice to Peel's patriotic purpose in undertaking this difficult task, we have to bear in mind that he did not personally approve of the king's action in breaking up the Melbourne administration, or even of the manner in which it had been broken up. He knew well enough that the king had grown tired of the Whig ministry, but he did not think the king's personal feelings were a complete justification for William's dismissal of a set of men whom he had consented to place in power. Peel did not regard the mere necessity for a rearrangement consequent on Lord Altrip's removal to the House of Lords as anything like a fitting excuse for the break-up of the whole government. More than that, Peel had no confidence in the chances of a new conservative administration just then. It was not encouraging to a statesman about to form his first cabinet 
to have to believe, as Peel did, that such a government would be left very much at the mercy of the opposition, and in more than one important or even impending question might at any time be outvoted in the House of Commons. Nonetheless, however, was Peel resolved to stand by his sovereign, who appeared to be in a difficulty. The same sense of public duty, according to his conception of public duty, which guided him at every great crisis of his political career, decided his action in this instance. He set himself to the work of forming an administration in which he proposed to take under his own charge the functions of Prime Minister and the office of Chancellor of the Exchequer. He knew that he could count on the support of the Duke of Wellington, and to Wellington he offered the post of Secretary for Foreign Affairs, which was at once accepted. Then he wrote to Sir James Graham, and to Lord Stanley, both refused. Sir James Graham, although he declined to accept office, promised Peel all the support he could give consistently with his own judgment and his own political views. Lord Stanley wrote a letter to Peel, which is even still both historical and personal interest. Its historical interest consists in the clear exposition it contains of the various questions which then divided the two great parties in the state. Its personal interest is found in the fact that it shows Lord Stanley as the convinced reformer who sees no possibility of his joining an administration about to be created by a statesman whose whole career has been antagonistic to political reform. Those of us who remember the brilliant orator Lord Darby, by whom the office of Prime Minister was three times held, find it hard to think of him as anything but a steady-going conservative at heart, and may be excused a shock of surprise when they are bidden to remember that in 1834 the same man, then Lord Stanley, declared that he could not serve under Peel because Peel was not reformer enough all round to secure his cooperation. Lord Stanley pointed out in his letter that between Peel and himself there had been a complete difference of opinion on almost every great public question except that which concerned the state church, and he reminded Peel that so lately as on the occasion of Lord Grey's retirement from office, the Duke of Wellington had seized the opportunity of publicly condemning the whole policy of the Whig administration. Under these circumstances, Lord Stanley declared that in his opinion it would be injurious to his own character and injurious to the new government as well if he were to accept the office of a place in such an administration. He had left Lord Grey's government because he differed from Lord Grey on one question alone, which then had to be dealt with, and he could not join a government of which Peel and Wellington were to be the leaders, from whom he had differed on almost every great political question that had engaged the attention of the country during his time. Peel had nothing for it but to go on with his task and form the best administration he could. Lord Lyndhurst was once again to be Lord Chancellor, and in such a man Peel certainly found a colleague who had no superior either as a lawyer or a debater in the House of Lords. Some of us who can still remember having heard Lord Lyndhurst deliver long and powerful speeches in the House of Lords, compelling the attention and the admiration of every listener when the orator himself had long left his eightieth year behind him, will feel sure that Sir Robert Peel's first administration was adequately represented in the hereditary chamber. It is not necessary to introduce here a full list of the new ministry, but there were three names which call for special mention. These are the names of three young men who then entered ministerial office for the first time, and with whom the world afterwards became well acquainted, each according to his different way. One was William Ewart Gladstone, who became junior Lord of the Treasury, and whom the world has long since recognized as the greatest statesman and the greatest master of the House of Commons known to the reign of Queen Victoria. The second was Sidney Herbert, who was for many years one of the most ready, accomplished, and brilliant debaters in that house, and whose premature death cut short a career that had seemed to be steadily rising from day to day. The third was a man whose political life has long since been forgotten, but whose name is well remembered because of his success in quite a different field, Winthrop Mackworth Prade, the charming author of delightful verses, 
the founder of that English school of minstrelsy which sings for the drawing-room and the club-room, the feasts and the fashions, the joys and the well-ordered troubles of the West End. Sidney Herbert and Prade were made joint secretaries to the Board of Control, the department established by Pitt for directing the government of India. The new Prime Minister believed that it would be in every way more suitable to the convenience of the country that he and his colleagues should submit their political claims and purposes to the judgment of the constituencies by means of a general election. A dissolution accordingly took place, and Peel issued an address to the electors of Tamworth, which will always be regarded as an important political document. Although Peel had been an opponent of the principles embodied in the Reform Bill, no reformer in the country understood better than he did the impossibility at such a time of carrying on the work of government without a thorough understanding between the ministry and the parliament, between the parliament and the public out of doors. No one knew better than Peel that the time had gone by never to return when an English minister could rule as an English minister, even so lately as in the days of Pitt had done, merely by the approval and the support of a monarch, without the approval and support of a majority of the electors. When, therefore, Peel prepared his address to his Tamworth constituents, he knew perfectly well that his words were meant not merely for the friendly ears of the little constituency, but for the consideration of the whole country. The same feeling accentuated the great statesman during the entire course of his subsequent career, and the constituency of Tamworth had therefore the advantage of being favored from time to time with election addresses which form chapters of the highest interest and importance in the historical literature of the country. The address which he issued to his constituents before the general election of December 1834 proclaimed, in fact, the opening of a new political era in England. Peel made frank announcement that, so far as he and his friends were concerned, the controversy about parliamentary reform had come to an end. By him and by them, the decision of Parliament, which sanctioned the introduction of the Reform Bill in 1832, was accepted as a final settlement of the question. Peel declared that he regarded it as a settlement which no friend to the peace of the country would attempt to disturb, either by direct or by insidious means. Of course, it was not to be understood that Peel had any intention of describing the Reform Act of 1832 as the last word of the Reformers' Creed, in the close of all possible controversy with regard to the construction of the whole parliamentary system. Peel no more meant to convey any idea of this than did Lord John Russell when he used the word finality in connection with the Reform Act, mean to convey the idea that, according to his conviction, Parliament was never again to be invited to extend the electoral franchise or to modify the conditions under which the votes of the electors were to be given. The announcement which Peel made to the electors of Tamworth and to the world in general was that he and his friends recognized the establishment of the representative principle in English political life, accepted the new order of things as a result of a lawful decree, and separated themselves altogether from the antiquated Toryism which enshrined the old ideas of government as a religious faith and revered the memory of the nomination boroughs as the Jacobites revered the memory of the Stuarts. With the issue of Peel's Tamworth Address in the December of 1834, the antique Tory, the Tory who made Toryism of the anti-reform days a creed and a cult, may be said to disappear altogether from the ranks of practical English politicians. The Tory of the old school appears, no doubt, here and there, through all parliamentary days, down to our own time. We saw him in both houses of Parliament as a heroic, unteachable opponent of Peel himself, of Bright and Cobden, of Gladstone, and sometimes even of Lord Derby and of Lord Salisbury, but he was merely a living protest against the succession of new ideas, and was no longer to be counted as a practical politician. Sir Robert Peel soon saw that he had not gained much by his appeal to the constituencies. The results of the general election showed that the Conservatives had made a considerable addition to their numbers in the House of Commons, but showed also that they were still in a disheartening minority. 
the return of the first reform parliament had indeed exhibited them for the time as completely down in the dust for there was a majority of more than three hundred against them and now the liberal majority was hardly more than one hundred a very hopeful conservative or a conservative who had a profound faith in the principles of antique toryism might fill himself with the fond belief that this increase in the conservative vote foretold a gradual return to the good old days but peel was too practical a statesman to be touched for a moment by any such illusion he had fully expected some increase in the tory vote he knew as well as anybody could know that there had been some disappointment among the more advanced and impatient reformers all over the country with the achievements of the first reformed parliament and indeed with the act of reform itself after victory in a long contested political battle there comes almost as a matter of course a season of relaxed effort among the ranks of the victors for which allowance would have to be made in the mind of such a statesman as peel and in this instance allowance also had to be made for a falling off in the enthusiasm of those who had helped to carry the reform movement to success and found themselves in the end left out of all its direct advantages peel saw at once that his government must be absolutely at the mercy of the opposition when any question arose on which it suited the purposes of the opposition leaders to rally their whole forces around them and take a party division so far as the ordinary business of the session was concerned the ministry might get on well enough for there must have been a considerable amount of routine work which would not provoke the opposition to a trial of strength. But if chance or hostile strategy should bring about at any moment a controversy which called for a strictly party division, then the government must go down. Nothing can be more trying to a proud-spirited statesman in office than the knowledge that he can only maintain his government from day to day because for one reason or another it does not suit the convenience of the opposition to press some vote which must leave him and his colleagues in a distinct minority. Peel had not long to wait before he found substantial evidence to justify his most gloomy forebodings. The new Parliament met on February 19, 1835. The first trial of strength was on the election of a new Speaker. The former occupant of the office, having been put forward for re-election, the government were beaten by a majority of ten. Now this was a very damaging event for the ministers, and also an event somewhat unusual in the House of Commons. There's generally a sort of understanding, more or less distinctly expressed, that the candidate put forward by the government for the office of Speaker is to be a man on whom both sides of the House can agree. It is obviously undesirable that there should be a party struggle over the appointment of the official who is assumed to hold an absolutely impartial position and is not supposed to be the mere favorite of either side of the house in later years there has often been a distinct arrangement or at all events a clear understanding between the government and the opposition on this subject and a candidate is not put forward unless there is good reason to assume that he will be acceptable to the two great political parties in this instance no such understanding existed or had been sought for the opposition set up a candidate of their own, and the nominee of the government was defeated. There was, however, one condition in this defeat, which, although it did not take away from the ominous character of the event, might to a certain extent have relieved Peel from the necessity of regarding it as an absolute party defeat. The majority had been obtained for the opposition by the support of the Irish members, who followed the leadership of Daniel O'Connell, and thus Sir Robert Peel saw himself outvoted by a combination of two parties, one of them regarded with peculiar disfavor by the majority of the English public on both sides of the political field. It was something for the followers of the government to be able to say that their liberal opponents had only been able to score a success by the help of the unpopular Irish vote, and it became in fact a new accusation against the liberals that they had traded on the favor of O'Connell and his Irish followers. From about this time, the Irish vote has always played an important part in all the struggles of parties in the House of Commons, and it will be observed that the English party, whether liberal or Tory, 
against which that vote is directed is always ready with epithets of scorn and anger for the English party for whom that vote has been given. Several other humiliations awaited Peel as the session went on. Sometimes he was saved from defeat on a question of finance by the help of the more advanced liberals, who came to his assistance when certain of his own Tory followers were prepared to desert him because his views on some question of taxation were much too new-fashioned for their own old-fashioned notions. Every one who has paid any attention to parliamentary history can understand how distressing is the position of a minister who has no absolute majority at his command, and how more distressing still is the position of a minister who can only look to chance disruptions and combinations of parties for any possible majority. Peel bore himself throughout all the trials of that most trying time with indomitable courage and with unfailing skill. Never during his whole career did he prove himself more brilliant and more full of resource than as the leader of what might be called an utterly hopeless struggle. The highest tribute has been paid to his never-failing tact and temper during that trying ordeal by his principal opponent in the House of Commons, Lord John Russell. Russell was now the leader of the Liberal opposition in the House of Commons, and the struggle of parties was once again illustrated by a sort of continuous parliamentary duel between two rival leaders. The same phenomenon had been seen from time to time in the days of Queen Anne and in the days of the Georges, and it was seen again at intervals during some of the most vivid and fascinating passages of parliamentary history in the reign of Queen Victoria. The crisis, however, came soon to this first ministry of Sir Robert Peel. Peel had announced in a reasonable and manful spirit, considering how the task of holding together a ministry had been imposed on him and the temptation which it afforded for the attacks of irresponsible enemies, that he would not resign office on any side issue or question of purely factitious importance, and that he would hold his place unless defeated by a vote of want of confidence or a vote of censure. He challenged the leader of the opposition to test the feeling of the House by a division on a question of that nature. Lord John Russell refused to take any such course, declaring that he believed it his duty to wait and see what might be the nature of the measures of reform which the government had promised to introduce before inviting the House to say whether the government deserved or did not deserve its confidence. Some of the measures announced by the government had to do with the reform of the ecclesiastical courts and the maintenance of church discipline, and Sir Robert Peel had himself given notice of a measure to deal with the Irish tithe system, the principal object of which was understood to be the transfer of the liability of the payment of tithes from the shoulders of the tenant to the shoulders of the landlord. It was not unreasonable that the opposition should proclaim it their policy to wait and see what the Tory ministers really proposed to do before assailing them with a direct and general vote of want of confidence. Even, however, if the opposition had been inclined to linger before inviting a real trial of strength, there was a feeling growing up all over the country which seemed impatient of mere episodical encounters leading to nothing in particular. The leaders of the opposition had a very distinct policy in their minds, and on March 30th, 1835, it found its formal expression. Lord John Russell moved a resolution which called upon the House to resolve itself into a committee in order to consider the present state of the Church established in Ireland with the view of applying any surplus of revenues not required for the spiritual care of its members, to the general education of all classes of the people without distinction of religious persuasion. Now here it will be seen was the battleground, distinctly marked out, on which the two political parties must come sooner or later to a decisive struggle. About the collection of tithes, about the imposition of tithes, about the class of the community on whom the direct responsibility for the payment of tithes ought to fall, there might possibly be a basis of agreement found between Tories and Whigs. 
but when there arose a question as to the appropriation of the church revenues, there the old doctrines and the new, the old Tories and the reformers, came into irreconcilable antagonism. The creed of the Tories was that the revenues of the church belonged to the church itself, and that if the church had a surplus of funds here or there for any one particular purpose, that surplus could be applied by it to some of its own purposes, but that no legislature had any right to say to the church, you have more money here than is needed for your own rights, and we have a right to take part of it away from you and apply it for the uses of the general public. The government, therefore, accepted Lord John Russell's resolution as a distinct challenge to a trial of strength on an essential question of policy. End of section 18. Section 19 of A History of the Four Georges and of William the Fourth, Volume 4, by Justin McCarthy and Justin Huntley McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 77, Peel's Forlorn Hope, Part 2. The debate which followed lasted through four days, and all the members of the House on both sides took part in it. The reports of that momentous debate may be read with the deepest interest even at this day, when some of the prophecies intended as terrible warnings by some of the conservative orators have long since been verified as facts and are calmly accepted by all parties as the inevitable results of rational legislation. Sir Robert Peel, Lord Stanley, Sir James Graham, and most others who spoke on the ministerial side spoke with one voice, in warning the House of Commons that if it claimed a right to touch any of the revenues of the Irish State Church in order to appropriate them for the general education of the Irish people, the result must be that the time would come when the Irish Church itself would no longer be held sacred against the desecrating hand of the modern reformer, would be treated as no longer necessary to the welfare of the Irish people, and would be severed from the state and left upon a level with the Roman Catholic Church and the various dissenting denominations. One appeal which may be said to run through the whole of the speeches on the side of the government is familiar to the readers and the audiences of all political debates, where any manner of reform is under discussion. You have asked, so runs the argument, to adopt this sort of policy, in order to satisfy the demands of a certain class of the population, but how do you know, what guarantee can you give us, that when we have granted these demands, they will be content and will not immediately begin to ask for more? We granted Catholic emancipation in order to satisfy Ireland, and now is Ireland satisfied? It was only the other day we granted Catholic emancipation, and now already Ireland declares through her representatives, that she ought to have part of the revenues of the Irish State Church taken away from that church and applied to the common uses of the Irish people. If she gets even that, will Ireland be contented? Will she not go on to demand repeal of the Union? We turn with peculiar interest to the speech of a young Tory member, which was listened to with great attention during the debate and was believed to contain unmistakable promise of an important political career. So indeed it did, although the promise that career actually realized was not altogether of the kind which most of its audience were led to anticipate. It was the speech of William Ewart Gladstone. The present motion, said Mr. Gladstone, opens a boundless road. It will lead to measure after measure, to expedient after expedient, till we come to the recognition of the Roman Catholic religion as the national one. In principle, we propose to give up the Protestant establishment. If so, why not abandon the political government of Ireland and concede the repeal of the legislative union? There is no principle, he went on to say, on which the Protestant church can be permanently upheld but that it is the church which teaches the truth. That, he insisted, 
was the position which the House ought to maintain without allowing its decision to be affected by the mere assertion, even if the assertion were capable of proof, that the revenues of the State Church in Ireland were entirely out of proportion to the spiritual needs of the Protestant population. Mr. Gladstone, however, had the mind of the financier even in those early days of his career, and he was at some pains to argue that the disproportion between the numbers of the Protestant and the Catholic populations in Ireland was not so great as Lord John Russell had asserted. He made out this part of his case ingeniously enough by including in the Protestant population in Ireland all the various members of the dissenting denominations, many or most of whom were as little likely to attend the administrations of the established church as the Roman Catholics themselves. Gladstone's speech was thoroughly consistent in its opposition to Lord John Russell's resolution on the ground that that resolution, if pressed to its legitimate conclusion, assailed the whole principle on which the state church in Ireland was founded. I hope, he said, I shall never live to see the day when such a system shall be adopted in this country for the consequences of it to public men will be lamentable beyond all description. If those individuals who are called on to fulfill the high function of administering public affairs should be compelled to exclude from their consideration the elements of true religion and to view various strange and conflicting doctrines in the same light instead of administering those noble functions, they will become helots and slaves." The weakness of Mr. Gladstone's case was found in the fact that he insisted on regarding the state church in Ireland as resting on precisely the same foundations as those which upheld the state church in England. The truth was afterwards brought home to him that every argument which could be fairly used to justify the maintenance of the state church in England was but another argument for the abolition of the state church in Ireland, a work which it became at last his duty to accomplish. I shall content myself, said Daniel O'Connell in his speech in the debate, with laying down the broad principle that the emoluments of a church ought not to be raised from a people who do not belong to it. Ireland does not ask for a Catholic establishment. The Irish desire political equality in every respect, except that they would not accept a single shilling for their church. Sir Robert Peel made a speech which was at once very powerful and very plausible. It was not perhaps pitched in a very exalted key, but it was full of argument, at once subtle and telling. It challenged the accuracy of Lord John Russell's figures, and he claimed against the injustice of inviting the House to pass a resolution founded on statistics, which it had as yet no possible opportunity of verifying or even of examining. He pointed out that the government had already given notice of their intention to bring in measures to deal with the very question concerned in Lord John Russell's resolution, and he asked what sincerity there could be in the purposes of men who professed a desire to amend as quickly as possible the tithe system in Ireland, and who yet were eager to deprive the government of any chance of bringing forward the measures which they had prepared in order to accomplish that very object. The main argument of the speech was directed not so much against the policy embodied in the resolution of Lord John Russell as against the manner in which it was proposed to carry out that policy. Sir Robert Peel declared that the object of the opposition was not to effect any improvement in the relations of the State Church of Ireland and the people of Ireland, but simply and solely to turn out the government. Why not, he asked, come to the point boldly and at once? Why not bring forward a vote of censure on the government or a vote of one of confidence in the government and thus compel them, if defeated, to go out of office, instead of endeavoring to enforce on them the adoption of a resolution dealing with questions which the government had already promised to make the subject of legislation, and without waiting to hear what manner of legislation they were prepared to introduce? There was an eloquent defiance in the closing words of Peel's speech. The great minister knew that defeat was awaiting him, and he showed himself resolved to meet it halfway. At three o'clock on the morning of April 3rd, the division on the resolution of Lord John Russell took place. There were 322 votes for the resolution and 289 against it. 
The resolution was therefore carried by a majority of 33. The student of history will observe with interest that the abolition of the Irish State Church was the result of a series of resolutions carried by Mr. Gladstone in the House of Commons in 1868 and afterwards embodied in an act of legislation. The debate on Lord John Russell's resolution was carried on for a few days longer, but it was chiefly concerned with mere questions as to the form in which the ministry was called upon to give effect to the wish of the majority and submit the resolution to the king. There was no heart or practical purpose in these debates, for everybody already knew what the end must be. On April 8th, Sir Robert Peel announced to the House that he could not take any part in giving effect to the resolution, and that therefore he and his colleagues had determined on resigning their offices. The course taken by Peel was thoroughly honest, consistent, and upright, and Lord John Russell bore prompt and willing testimony to the constitutional propriety of the retiring Prime Minister's resolve. The Peel ministry had come to its end. The country had been put to the trouble and expense of a general election. Valuable time had been wasted, legislative preparations had been thrown away, and everything was now back again in just the same condition as when the king made up his mind to dismiss the Melbourne administration. The whole blame for the muddle rested on the king, who now found himself compelled to take up again with Lord Melbourne, just as if nothing had happened. The king, indeed, made an attempt to induce Lord Grey to come out of his retirement and form another ministry, but Lord Grey was not to be prevailed upon to accept such an invitation, and William had to gulp down his personal objections and invite Lord Melbourne to come back once more and take charge of the government of the country. Lord Melbourne had no difficulty in forming an administration, and it was on the whole very much the same in its composition as that which King William had so rudely dismissed only a few months before. But there were some new names on the list, and there was one very remarkable omission. Lord Brougham was not one of the members of the new government. Lord Melbourne had made up his mind that if perhaps there could be no living without such a colleague, there certainly could be no living with him, and he preferred the chance to the certainty. The greatest sensation was produced all over the country when it was found that Lord Brougham was to have nothing to do with the new administration. In and out of Parliament, the question became a subject of keen and vehement discussion. The energy and eloquence of Brougham had held a commanding place among the forces by which parliamentary reform had been effected, and the wonder was how any reform ministry could venture to carry on the work of government not merely without the cooperation of such a man, but with every likelihood of his active and bitter hostility. At one time the report went abroad and found many ready believers that there were periods in Brougham's life when his great intellect became clouded, as Chatham's had been at one time, in that the liberal ministry found it therefore impossible to avail themselves of his fitful services. Lord Melbourne himself once made an emphatic appeal to his audience in the House of Lords, after Lord Brougham had delivered a speech there of characteristic power and eloquence. Melbourne invited the House to consider calmly how overmastering must have been the reasons which compelled any body of rational statesmen to deprive themselves of such a man's cooperation. It would appear, however, that the reasons which influenced Melbourne and his colleagues were given by Brougham's own passionate and ungovernable temper, his impatience of all discipline, his sudden changes of mood and purpose, his overmastering egotism, and his frequent impulse to strike out for himself and to disregard all considerations of convenience or compromise, all calculations as to the effect of an individual movement on the policy of an administration. From that time, Brougham had nothing more to do with ministerial work. He became merely an independent, a very independent member of the House of Lords. To the close of his long career, he was a commanding figure in the House and in the country, but it was an individual figure, an eccentric figure, whose movements must always excite interest, but often excite admiration, 
but from whom guidance and inspiration were never to be expected. Even on some of the great questions with which the brightest part of his career had been especially associated, he often failed to exercise the influence which might have been expected from a man of such gifts and such achievements. Through the remainder of his life, he could always arouse the attention of the country and indeed of the civilized world when he so willed, but his work as a political leader was done. The office of Lord Chancellor was left for a while vacant, or to describe the fact in more technical knowledge was put into commission. The commission was made up of the master of the rolls, the vice-chancellor, and one of the judges. After a time, Lord Cottenham was made Lord Chancellor. Lord John Russell became Home Secretary, and Lord Palmerston was Foreign Secretary. Among the new names on the list of the administration was that of Sir Henry Parnell, who became Paymaster General and Paymaster of the Navy, and that of Sir George Grey, who was Under Secretary of the Colonies, and afterwards rose to hold high office in many a government, and had at one time the somewhat undesirable reputation of being the rapidest speaker in the House of Commons. King William must have put a strong constraint upon himself when he found that he had to receive on terms at least of civility so many of the men as ministers whom he had abruptly dismissed from his service not long before. For a considerable time he put up with them rather than received them, and maintained a merely official relationship with them, so far even as not to invite them to dinner. After a time, however, His Majesty somewhat softened in temper, the relations between him and his advisers became less strained, and he even went so far as to invite the members of the cabinet to dinner, and expressed in his invitation the characteristic wish that each guest would drink at least two bottles of wine. When the construction of the new ministry had been completed, Parliament reassembled on April 18th, but that meeting was little more than a formal character, as the Houses had again to adjourn in order to enable the new members who were members of the House of Commons to resign and seek, according to constitutional usage, for re-election at the hands of their constituents. The only public interest attached to the meeting of Parliament on April 18th was found in an attempt made by two Tory peers to extract from Lord Melbourne some public explanation as to his dealings with O'Connell and the Irish party. Lord Melbourne was quite equal to the occasion, and nothing could be drawn from him further than the declaration that he had entered into no arrangements whatever with O'Connell, that if the Irish members should on any occasion give him their support, he would be happy to receive it, but that he had not taken and did not mean to take any steps to secure it. The incident is worth noting because it serves to illustrate, once again, the effect of the new condition which had been introduced into the struggles of the two great political parties by the passing of the Catholic Emancipation Act and the consequent admission of Irish Catholic members into the House of Commons. Some of the members of the new administration were not successful when they made their appeal to their old constituencies. Lord John Russell, for instance, was beaten in South Devonshire by a Tory antagonist, and a vacancy had to be made for him in the little borough of Stroud, the representative of which withdrew in order to oblige the leaders of his party, and obtained in return for his act of self-sacrifice an office under government. Lord Palmerston was placed in a difficulty of the same kind, and a vacancy was made for him in the borough of Tiverton by the good nature and public spirit of its sitting representative, and from that time to the end of his long career, Lord Palmerston continued to be the member for Tiverton, which indeed won, by that fact alone, a conspicuous place in parliamentary history. There were other disturbances of the same kind in the relations of the members of the new government and their former constituents, and it was clear enough that a certain reaction was still working against the political impulse which had carried the reform measures to success. Still, it was clear that the new government had come into power as a government of reformers, and Lord Melbourne found himself compelled to go on with the work of reform. Nothing could be less in keeping with his habits and the inclinations of his easy-going nature. It used to be said of him that whenever he was urged to set about any work of the kind, his instinctive impulse always was to meet the suggestion with the question, Why can't you let it alone? 
Now, however, he had in his cabinet some men like Lord John Russell, whose earnestness in the cause of reform was genuine and unconquerable, and if Lord Melbourne was too indolent to press forward reforms on his own account, he was also too indolent to resist such a pressure when put on him by others. There was one great pressing and obvious reform which remained to be accomplished and ought naturally to follow on the reorganization of the parliamentary system. That was the reorganization of the municipal system. The municipal work of the country, the management of all the various and complicated relations which concerned the local affairs of the whole community, had become a mere chaos of anomalies, anachronisms, and in too many instances of reckless mismanagement and downright corruption. If the sort of so-called representation which prevailed in the parliamentary constituencies was, up to 1832, an absurdity and a fraud, it was not perhaps on the whole quite so absurd or altogether so fraudulent as that which set itself up for a representative system in the arrangements of the municipal corporations. As in the case of the parliamentary system, so in the case of the municipal system, the organization had begun with an intelligible principle to guide it, but during the lapse of years and even of centuries, the original purpose had been swamped by the gradual and always increasing growth of confusion and corruption. The municipal arrangements of England had begun as a practical protest against the feudal system. While the feudal laws or customs still prevailed, the greater proportion of the working classes were really little better than serfs at the absolute control of their feudal lords and masters, the comparatively small proportion of men who formed the trading class of the community found themselves compelled to devise some kind of arrangement for the security of themselves, their traffic, and their property against the dominion of the ruling class. It was practically impossible that a mere serf could devote his energies to a craft or trade with any hope of independence for himself or any chance of contributing to the prosperity of his working and trading neighbors. The trading, manufacturing, and commercial classes in each locality began to form themselves into groups, or what might be called guilds, of their own, with the object of common protection in order to secure an opening for their traffic and their industry, and for the preservation of the earnings and the profits which came of their skill and energy. These trading groups asserted for themselves their right to free action in all that regarded the regulation of their work and the secure disposal of their profits, and thus they became what might be called governing bodies in each separate locality. One common principle of these governing bodies was that no one should be allowed to become a craftsman or trader in any district if he were a serf, and they claimed and gradually came to maintain the right to invest others with the title and privileges of free men. This right of freemanship soon became hereditary, and the male children of a freeman were to be freemen themselves. In many communities the man who married a freeman's daughter acquired, if he had not been free before, the right of freemanship. No qualification of residence was necessary to enable a man thus to become free, the self-organized community, whatever it might be, had the right of creating any stranger a freeman according as it thought fit. We find this ancient system still in harmless and graceful illustration when a public man who has distinguished himself in the service of the country is honored by admission to the freedom of some ancient city. But in the far-off days when the system was in practical operation, the unlimited right of creating freemen came to mean that in many cities, towns, and localities of all descriptions, a number of outsiders who had no connection by residence, property, or local interest of any kind with the district, and who were wholly irresponsible to the public opinion of the local community, had the right to interfere in the management of its affairs and to become members of its municipal body for the local traders soon began to form themselves into councils or committees for the management of the local affairs, and in fact became what might be described as self-elected municipal corporations, trustees who had assumed the trust for themselves, local lawmakers whose term of office was lifelong, and against whose decision there was no available court of appeal. 
In some cases, these local bodies actually arrogated to themselves the right of passing penal laws and trying cases and awarding punishments. The local municipalities sometimes exercised the power of appointing recorders to preside over their courts of law, and it happened in many instances that the municipal body made no condition as to the recorder being a member of any branch of the legal profession. It is hardly necessary to point out some of the inevitable consequences of such a system. The municipal bodies voted what salaries they pleased out of the local funds, and named according to their pleasure the persons to receive the salaries. They disposed of the corporate revenues in any way they thought fit, and indeed in many cases they claimed and annexed as corporate property possessions that had always, up to the time of the annexation, been supposed to belong to the public at large. They usurped for themselves all manner of privileges and so-called rights, and if they thought fit, offered them for purchase to the highest bidder. The whole governing body often consisted of a very small number of residents who had elected themselves to office, and as they had the power of making themselves very disagreeable to disputants, they did not often find individuals public-spirited enough to challenge their right to local control. It happened much more frequently that if any man were strong enough to make his opposition inconvenient or uncomfortable for the local rulers, they got over the trouble by prevailing on him to become one of themselves, to share their privileges and profits, and to strengthen their authority. A local magnate, the head of some great family, a peer of old descent, was often thus nobbled, to use a modern colloquialism, and was allowed to make as many freemen as he pleased, and to take whatever part he would in the control of municipal affairs. It would be superfluous to say that the municipalities became a constantly working instrument in the hands of this or that political party. Wherever the Whigs or the Tories were strong, there the constituencies, such as they were, could always be placed at the absolute disposal of some local magnate. Even in the districts where there was but little actual corruption, there was often the most extravagant waste of the public funds and public property, and the most utter neglect of all the ordinary ways of business and of economy. For a long time, the increasing evils of the system had been attracting the attention and arousing the alarm of enlightened and public-spirited men all over the country, and of course, when the great measure of reform had dealt with the political system, it was obvious that the reforming hand must before long touch the municipal system as well. Shortly after the passing of the Reform Bill, Lord Altrip had appointed a commission to inquire into the whole history, growth, and working of the municipal corporations, and the report had brought out an immense amount of systematized information on which the liberal statesmen, now once again in office, were determined to act. Lord Melbourne entrusted the task of preparing and conducting through the House of Commons a measure for this purpose to the capable hands of Lord John Russell, who was now the leader of the government in that house. Lord John Russell's measure was, in fact, the foundation of the whole municipal system which we see spread over the country in our times. It proposed to begin by abolishing altogether the freeman system and placing the election of local governing bodies in the hands of residents who paid a certain amount of taxation. In fact, it made the municipal bodies representative in just the same sense as the parliamentary constituencies had been made representative by the Reform Act. It remodeled altogether the local law courts and legal arrangements of the municipalities and ordered that the appointment of recorders should be in the hands of the Crown, that each recorder was to be a barrister of a certain standing, and that a recorder should be nominated for every borough which undertook to provide a suitable salary for the occupant of the office. Provision was also made for the proper management of charitable trusts and funds. The measure was to apply to 183 boroughs, not including the metropolis, with an average of 11,000 persons to each borough. Some of the larger boroughs were to be divided into wards, and in most cases the intention of the measure was that the boundaries of the parliamentary borough should be the boundaries of the municipal borough as well. 
the governing body of each municipality was to consist of a mayor and councillors, the councillors to be elected by resident ratepayers. It was proposed that the rights of living freemen were to be maintained, but as each life lapsed, the right was to be extinguished, and thus the whole freeman system was to die out, and all exclusive trading privileges were to be abolished. The bill, as introduced by Lord John Russell, only applied to England and Wales, but O'Connell demanded that Ireland should also be included in the reform, and it was finally agreed that a bill of the same nature should be brought in for Ireland, and that arrangements should be made with the Scottish representatives to have the provisions of the measure applied also to Scotland, so far as might be consistent with the usages and the desire of the Scottish people. Sir Robert Peel did not offer any direct opposition to the measure, although he criticized it severely enough in some of its provisions. His speech, however, was distinctly a declaration in favor of some comprehensive scheme of municipal reform, and might fairly have been regarded rather as a help than as a hindrance to the purposes of the government. The example set by Sir Robert Peel had naturally much influence over the greater number of the conservative party, and only some very old-fashioned conservatives seemed inclined to make a stand against the measure. Mr. Grote seized the opportunity to introduce a motion for the adoption of the ballot in the municipal elections, but it is hardly necessary to say that he did not secure support enough on either side of the House to win success for his proposition. The bill passed through the House of Commons without any important changes in its character, but it met with very serious maltreatment in the House of Lords. The majority of the peers did not see their way to compass the actual rejection of the bill, especially after the liberal and statesmanlike spirit in which Sir Robert Peel had dealt with it, but they set themselves to work with the object of rendering it as nearly useless as they could for the purposes which its promoters had in view. Lord Lyndhurst led the opposition to the bill, and he could, when he so pleased, become the very narrowest of Tories, while he had ability and plausibility not included in the intellectual stock of any other Tory then in the House of Lords. Under this leadership, the Tory peers so disfigured and mangled the bill that before long its own authors could hardly have recognized it as the work of their hands. The peers not only restored all or nearly all the abuses and anomalies which the measure as it left the House of Commons had marked for utter abolition, but they even went so far as to introduce into their version of the bill some entirely new and original suggestions for the creation of abuses up to that time unknown to the existing municipal system. The bill thus diversified had, of course, to go back to the House of Commons, and it is hardly necessary to say that the House of Commons could not, as the parliamentary phrase goes, agree with the Lord's amendments. Peel once again took a statesmanlike course and strongly advised the House of Lords not to press their absurd and objectionable alterations. In the House of Lords itself, the Duke of Wellington, acting as he always did under the influence of Peel, recommended the Tory peers not to carry their opposition too far, and before long Lord Lyndhurst, who was by temperament and intellect a very shrewd and practical man, with little of the visionary or the fanatic about him, thought it well to accept Wellington's advice and to urge its acceptance on his brother conservatives. Lord John Russell recommended the House of Commons to accept a compromise on a few insignificant details, in no wise affecting the general purposes of the measure, in order to soothe the wounded feelings of the peers and enable them to yield with the comforting belief that after all their resistance had not been wholly in vain. The struggle was over, and on September 7, 1835, the measure became law in the same shape, to all practical purposes, as that which it wore when it left the House of Commons after its third reading there, and thus secured for Great Britain and Ireland the system of municipal government which has been working to this day. End of Section 19 
Section 20 of A History of the Four Georges and of William the Fourth, Volume 4, by Justin McCarthy and Justin Huntley McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 78, Still the Reign of Reform, Part 1. The movement for the diffusion of education among the people had been making steady progress during the reign of William the Fourth, and some of the most distinct and lasting memorials of that movement have come to be associated with the history of the reign. One of these was the granting of a charter for the establishment of a great university which was to bear the name of the capital and was to confer its degrees, its honors, and its offices without any conditions as to the religious profession of those whom it educated and whom it taught and qualified by appointment to conduct the education of others. The old universities of Oxford and Cambridge were then directly associated with the state church and only gave the stamp of their approval and the right to teach to those who professed the religion established by law. There had been growing up for some time a feeling in the community that there was need for a system of university teaching which should be open alike to the members of all creeds and denominations, and even to those who did not profess to subscribe to the doctrines of any particular creed or to enroll themselves in the ranks of any particular denomination. The institutions which are now known as University College London and the University of London are among the most remarkable growths of this movement. After years of effort, the charters for these institutions were granted by King William in 1836, and it is needless to say that University College has played a great part in the spreading of education among the middle and poorer classes throughout the country. Henry Brougham was one of the most active promoters of the effort, to bring the higher education and its honors within the reach of all classes and creeds, and his name will always be distinctly associated with the rapid progress made in the spread of knowledge during the earlier part of the 19th century. Broome was one of the founders and promoters of the Penny Cyclopedia for the diffusion of useful knowledge, which delighted some of our grandfathers, amazed and bewildered others, and filled yet others with a holy horror at the daring effort to upset all the wholesome distinctions of ranks and classes by cramming the lower orders with an amount of knowledge wholly unsuited to their subordinate condition, and unfitting them for the proper discharge of the duties associated with that station in life to which it had pleased Providence to call them. Brougham also took a leading part in the founding of the British Association for the Advancement of Science, which was established by Sir David Brewster, Sir Roderick Murchison, and many other men famous in science and in letters in 1831. It has been holding its annual meetings in all the great cities and towns of these islands ever since, and is not likely to be interrupted in the continuance of its work. The British Association was the subject of a good deal of cheap ridicule in its early days, and caricaturists, most of them long since forgotten, delighted in humorous illustrations of the oddities by which social life was to be profusely diversified when science was taught at popular meetings, and not merely men but even women and young women could sit in the public hall and listen to great professors discoursing on the construction of the earth and the laws which regulate the movements of the heavenly bodies. The present generation has almost completely forgotten even the fact that the British Association was once a familiar and favorite subject for the pen and pencil of satirists. The schoolmaster is abroad, was an expression used by Brougham to illustrate the educational movement which was going on in his time, in which he did as much as any man could have done to set and keep in motion. King William himself, we may be sure, took only a very moderate interest in all these goings-on. But, at all events, he did not stand in the way of the general educational movement, and indeed he gave it a kindly word of patronage and encouragement 
whenever it seemed a part of his state functions to sanction the progress of science by his royal recognition. Among the many reforms accomplished in this reign of reform was that which effected the practical abolition of the system of impressment for the navy, that system which had so long worked its purposes through the action of what was familiarly known as the press gang. The press gang system had been in force from very remote days indeed, for it is shown by statute and by record to have been in operation before 1378. In 1641, the practice was declared illegal by Parliament, but Parliament might just as well not have troubled itself upon the subject, for the impressment of seamen went on just as if nothing had happened. Whenever seamen were required to man the royal fleet in time of war, the press gang instantly came into operation. Its mode of action was simple and straightforward, and consisted of the forcible arrest and complete capture of merchant seamen and fishermen or stalwart young men of any kind in seaport towns who looked as if they had seen service on some kind of sailing craft. The ordinary practice was that an officer and a party of seamen and marines landed from some ships of war in the harbor and seized and carried off any number of men who seemed to them suitable for their purpose and dragged them as prisoners on board war vessels, where they were compelled to serve until such time as their help might be no longer needed. The literature of England almost down to our own times is diversified here and there by illustrations of the scenes which were created in our seaport towns by this practice. Smollett has more than one animated picture of this kind, the sea stories of Captain Marriott's days abound in such illustrations, and even romance of the higher order and poetry itself have found subjects for picturesque and pathetic narrative in the stories of young men thus torn from their families without a moment's notice and compelled to go on a ship of war and fight the foreign enemy at sea. The pay of an able seaman in a ship of war was, in those times, very poor. The life was one of hardship and there was little to tempt a young man of ordinary ways and temperament to enter the naval service of his sovereign. The seaport towns and the towns on the great rivers were called upon by royal authority to supply a certain proportionate number of men for service in the navy, and the local governing bodies did their best, we may be sure, by the offer of bounties and other encouragements to induce young men to volunteer for the sea. In times of war, however, when sudden demands were made on the part of the crown for the efficient manning of the navy, these encouragements and temptations often failed to procure anything like the required amount of voluntary service, and then it was that the press gang came into work to meet the demand by force. During the long wars which followed the outbreak of the French Revolution, the press gang had a busy time of it. Vessels of war were in the constant habit of summoning merchant vessels to hand over a certain number of their seamen, and the merchant vessels were brought to just as if they had been the cruisers of the enemy and were boarded by force, whenever force seemed necessary, and compelled to supply the requisite number. It sometimes happened that the captain of a vessel failed to understand the meaning of the peremptory summons issued to him, and he was then promptly brought to an understanding of the situation by the shot of the war vessel and the appearance of an armed boarding party on his own decks. Nor was it even a very unusual event for the captain of the merchant vessel to offer a resistance, and then there was a regular sea fight between the British war vessel and the British merchantman, in which, of course, the latter was very soon compelled to acknowledge the validity of the royal warrant. In the ordinary course of things, however, the captain of the war vessel sent an officer and a party of men on shore, and their business was to make any captures they pleased in that part of the town where men fit for service at sea were most likely to be found. There are stories told, and told on historic evidence as truth, about young husbands thus captured and thrown into prison to await their removal to some war vessel off the coast, and whose wives or mothers could devise no better means for their rescue than to obtain an interview with them in prison 
and there contrived so to mutilate the hands of the captives through the bars of the cell as to render them unfit for service in the royal navy sometimes when it became known that the press gang was about to visit that part of the town where seafaring men were likely to be found the population of the quarter rallied in defense of their townsmen and offered just such resistance to the emissaries of the naval authorities as they would have offered to an invading enemy streets were barricaded from the high windows of houses stones were hurled down and volleys of musketry were fired crowds of armed men and even sometimes of armed women met the invaders in the street itself and disputed their progress inch by inch in the lower quarters of portsmouth and other seaport towns such scenes were of frequent occurrence the whole system had among its other harmful effects a very damaging influence on the navy itself and on its discipline the press gang was not very choice in making up its contributions of recruits for the fleet no great pains were taken with a view to obtain certificates as to character and conduct those who formed the recruiting expedition were only too ready to seize any strapping young men whom they found loitering about the streets and lanes of the lower quarters in a seaport town these strapping young men often turned out to be rising young men of the criminal classes but their limbs and muscles made them like some of falstaff's recruits good enough to toss food for powder and they were promptly swooped upon and carried off to serve in his majesty's navy such captives as these when put on board a vessel of war and compelled to serve as seamen there had the influence which might have been expected from them over the habits of the whole crew the severest and even the most savage methods of discipline were often found necessary to force such men into habits of obedience and into anything like decent conduct flogging then and for long after prevailed in the navy and in the army and one of the most familiar arguments in favor of keeping up that form of discipline was found in the fact that in many cases the new recruits might have corrupted the habits of a whole ship's company if they had not been compelled by frequent floggings to obey orders submit themselves to rules and conduct themselves with decency for a long time a strong feeling had been growing up among philanthropists and reformers of all kinds against the practice of impressment and against the discipline of the cat as the flogging instrument was commonly termed the philanthropists and the reformers generally were met by the old sort of familiar argument they were told that it would be utterly impossible to man a navy if the press gang were to be abolished and equally impossible to keep the navy up to its work and in decent condition if seamen were no longer liable to the punishment of the lash the innovators were asked whether they knew better how to raise and maintain an efficient navy than did the naval authorities on whose shoulders rested the responsibility of defending the shores of england from foreign invasion those who made themselves conspicuous by their advocacy of what were then beginning to be called humanitarian principles were roundly accused of want of patriotism and it was often suggested that they were anti-english in their sentiments and their instincts and were persons who would probably on the whole rather welcome the foreign invader than lend a hand to drive him back the spirit of humanity and of reform was in the air however and in the reformed parliament there were many men who had as good a gift of eloquence as the best of their opponents and who could not be frightened out of any purpose on which they had set their minds and hearts in eighteen thirty five the government of lord melbourne brought in a measure for the abolition of the press gang system and for limitation of compulsory service in the navy to a period of five years this measure not only had its own direct and immediate beneficial effects but it also did much to prepare the way for the abolition of flogging many years indeed had to pass before this latter reform could be accomplished but it was clear that when the manning of the navy no longer brought with it its captures from the criminal classes the time was coming for the gradual adoption of a system of discipline more in accordance with the principles of humanity and the character of a noble service as we have seen 
in all previous experiences of reform, the forebodings of the anti-reformers proved to be utterly false alarms in regard to the manning and discipline of the navy. We have seen some foreign wars since the days of William the Fourth, and we have heard alarms of foreign invasions again and again, but the navy, under its improved conditions, has never been in want of volunteers to man it, and the greatest lovers of peace have always proclaimed it to be the surest and best defense of the country. There were many leading men in the House of Commons since those days who persistently demanded a reduction in the army on the very ground that England could safely defy any foreign foe so long as she had the bulwark of such a navy. One great, solid, and picturesque memorial is destined to associate the reign of William the Fourth with the history of English architecture. We speak of the Houses of Parliament, which stand on the banks of the river, and thus have the Thames on one side and Westminster Abbey on the other. The great range of halls and towers, terraces, arches, squares, and courtyards, which until comparatively recent days were often described in common phrase as the new houses of Parliament, owe their origin and their plan, although not their complete construction, to the reign of William the Fourth. On the evening of October 16th, 1834, the old buildings in which the Lords and the Commons used to assemble were completely destroyed by fire. The fire broke out so suddenly on that evening and spread with such extraordinary rapidity that many of those who were engaged in occupations of one kind or another in various parts of the buildings had much difficulty in escaping with their lives. The flames spread so fast that in an almost incredibly short space of time, the two houses of Parliament and almost all the offices, residences, and other buildings attached to them were seen to be devoted to hopeless ruin. For a while, it seemed almost certain that Westminster Hall itself must be involved in the common destruction and even the noble abbey, with its priceless memorial treasures, appeared destined to become a mere ruin of shattered stones. The arrangements for the extinguishing of fires were rude and poor and inefficient in those days when compared with the systematized service which is employed in our own, and for a considerable time those who hurried to the spot, charged with the duty of combating the conflagration, appeared to do little better than get in each other's way and only give new chances to each fresh eruption. The tide in the river was very low, too, when the destroying work began, and it was hard, indeed, to bring any great body of water to bear upon the flames. As the tide rose, however, it became easier to make more effective efforts. At last it was found that Westminster Abbey might be considered perfectly safe. So was Westminster Hall, that noble historical enclosure, the hall which saw the trial of William Wallace, of Charles I, of Somers and of Warren Hastings, the hall which celebrated the coronation of so many kings, which boasts of being the oldest chamber in Europe held in continuous occupation up to the present day, the largest hall in Europe unsupported by pillars. It was preserved to be the grand entrance and vestibule to both the Houses of Parliament. But the chambers in which up to that day the Lords and Commons had conducted their legislative work were utterly destroyed. At first it was assumed, as is almost always the assumption in the case of any great conflagration, that the work of destruction had been the outcome of an incendiary plot, and for a while a wild idea spread abroad that some modern Guy Fox had succeeded where his predecessor had completely failed. But it was soon made clear and certain that the whole calamity, if indeed it can be called much of a calamity, had been the result of a mere accident. A careless workman aspiring to nothing more than a quick release from his labor, and not destined to the fame of the aspiring youth who fired the Ephesian dome, had brought about the ruin which bequeathed to England and to the world 
the vast and noble structure of Westminster Palace. The workman was engaged in burning up a number of the old disused wooden tallies, which once used to be employed in the court of exchequer, and he heaped too large a bundle of them on the fire. At an unlucky moment, a flame suddenly blazed up, which caught hold of the furniture in the room, and in another moment set the whole building on fire, and then created the vast conflagration which wrought so much destruction. We have expressed a certain doubt as to whether the burning of the old houses of Parliament is really to be regarded as a national calamity, and the doubt is founded partly on the admitted fact that the chambers which existed before the fire were quite unequal in size and in accommodation to the purposes for which they were designed, and partly on the architectural magnificence of the buildings which succeeded them. The Lords and Commons found accommodation where they could, while preparations were in progress for the building of new and better chambers, any parliamentary committee was soon appointed to consider and report upon the best means of providing the country with more commodious and more stately houses of Parliament. The committee ventured on a recommendation which was considered, at the time, a most daring piece of advice. The recommendation was that the contract for the erection of the new houses of Parliament should be thrown absolutely open to public competition. Nothing like that proposal had ever been heard of under similar conditions in English affairs up to that time. What seemed to most persons the most natural and proper plan, the seemly becoming and orderly plan, which would have been to allow the sovereign or some other great state personage to select the court architect who might be thought most fitting to be entrusted with so great a task, and let him work out as best he could the pleasure of his illustrious patron. The committee, however, were able to carry their point, and the contract for the great work was thrown open to unrestricted competition. Out of a vast number of designs submitted for approval, the committee selected the design sent in by Mr. Barry, afterwards Sir Charles Barry, the famous architect who has left many other monuments of his genius to the nation, but whose most conspicuous monument assuredly is found in the pile of buildings which ornament the Thames at Westminster. End of section 20. Section 21 of A History of the Four Georges and of William the Fourth, Volume 4, by Justin McCarthy and Justin Huntley McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 78. Still the Reign of Reform, Part 2. Only the mere fact that the selection of the design for the new building was made during the lifetime of William the Fourth connects the reign of that monarch with the history of Westminster Palace. It was not until the reign of Queen Victoria had made some way that the towers of the palace began to show themselves above the river, but the new principle which offered the design for the work to public competition, and the fact that Mr. Barry's design was chosen from all others, oblige us to associate the building of the new chambers with the reign of a sovereign whose name otherwise was not likely to be identified with any triumph of artistic genius. We must not set down to any defects in the architect's constructive skill the fact that the new House of Commons was almost as inadequate to the proper accommodation of its members as the old house had been. The present House of Commons does not provide seating accommodation for anything like the number of members who are entitled to have seats on its benches, even if the gallery set apart for the use of members only, galleries that are practically useless for the purposes of debate, were to be filled to their utmost, there still would not be room for nearly all the members of the House of Commons. But at the time when the new house was built, the general impression of statesmen on both sides seemed to be that if the chamber were made spacious enough to give a seat to every member, the result would be that the room would be too large for anything like practical, easy, and satisfactory discussion, and that the chamber would become a mere hall of declamation. At that time, almost all the business of the house, 
even to its most intimate details of legislation, was done in the debating chamber itself. The scheme which was adopted a great many years later, and by means of which the shaping of the details of legislative measures is commonly relegated to grand committees, as the parliamentary phrase goes, had not then found any favor with statesmen. The daily work of the House was left for the most part in the hands of the members of the administration and the leading members of the opposition, or in cases where the interests of a particular class or trade or district were concerned, to the men who had special knowledge of each subject of legislation. It was therefore argued, and with much plausibility, that to construct a chamber large enough to hold seats for all the members would be to impose an insupportable and at the same time a quite unnecessary strain upon the energies and the lungs of the comparatively small number of men by whom the actual business of the house had to be carried on. This argument was used with much effect, not many years before his death, by Mr. Gladstone himself, and there can be no doubt that it maintained itself against the many successive proposals which have been made from time to time for the enlargement of the representative chamber. In most other legislative halls, on the continent, or in the United States, or in Canada, each member has his own seat, and finds it ready for his occupation at any time. But in the House of Commons, on great occasions, the ordinary member has to come to the House at the earliest moment when its doors are open, hours and hours before the business begins, in order to have even a chance of obtaining a seat during the debate, and a large number of members are fated, whatever their energy in their early rising, to sigh for a seat in vain. The question has been raised again and again in the House of Commons, and all manner of propositions have been brought forward and plans suggested for the enlargement of the debating chamber, but up to the present the condition of things remains just as it was when the new Houses of Parliament were opened in the reign of Queen Victoria. Sir Charles Barry's design has the great advantage that it renders an increase in the size of the House of Commons possible and practicable without a complete reconstruction of all that part of the vast building which belongs to the representative chamber and its various offices. In the opinion of many leading members of the House of Commons, the number of the representatives is needlessly large for the purposes demanded by an adequate and proportionate system of representation, and it is not difficult to foresee changes which might lead with universal satisfaction to a reduction in the number of members in the House of Commons. It may also be anticipated that the system that relegates the details of legislative measures to the consideration of grand committees may be gradually extended as time goes on, and that thus the committee work of the House of Commons itself may grow less and less by degrees. In either case, or in both cases altogether, it might easily come to pass that the present debating chamber would supply ample sitting room to all its members on every ordinary occasion, although it is hardly possible to understand how on a night of great debate, with a momentous division impending, the present chamber could be expected to accommodate the full number of members entitled to claim seats there. At all events, it is hardly possible to imagine any condition of things arising which could call for any alteration in the construction of the representative chamber which would be likely to affect in the slightest degree the general character of that palace of legislation which was planned and founded during the reign of William the Fourth, was opened in the reign of Queen Victoria, and will bear down to posterity the name of its architect, Sir Charles Barry. Before leaving this subject, it is of interest to note that the question of providing accommodation for ladies desiring to listen to the debates in the House of Commons was brought up more than once during the reign of William the Fourth. Miss Martineau, in her History of the Thirty Years' Peace, makes grave complaint of the manner in which the proposal for the admission of ladies to hear the debates was treated alike by the legislators who favored and by those who resisted the proposition. The whole subject, she appears to think, was treated as a huge joke. One set of members advocated the admission of ladies on the ground, among other reasons, that their presence in the House of Commons would tend to keep the legislators sober, and prevent them from garnishing their speeches with unseemly expressions. 
Another set stood out against the proposal on the ground that if ladies were allowed to sit in a gallery in sight of the members, the result would be that the representatives would cease to pay any real attention to the business of debate and would occupy themselves chiefly in studying the faces and the dresses of the fair visitors and try to interchange glances with the newly admitted spectators. The conditions under which ladies may be permitted to listen to the debates in the House of Commons form a subject of something like periodical discussion up to the present day. There is, as everybody knows, a certain number of seats set apart behind the press gallery in the House of Commons for the accommodation of women who are admitted by orders which members can obtain who are successful in a balloting process which takes place a week in advance. About twenty members only out of more than six hundred can win two seats each for any one sitting of the House, and no member can approach the ballot for at least a week after he has accomplished a success. The ladies' gallery holds only a very small number of women, and it is jealously screened by a gilded grating, something like that, through which the women of an eastern potentate's household are permitted to gaze upon the stage from their box in the theatre. It will perhaps be news to some readers to hear that this ladies' gallery, such as it is, is technically not within the precincts of the House of Commons at all. It is not an institution of the House, nor does it come under the rules of the House, nor is it recognized by the authorities of the House. It is there, as a matter of fact, but it is not supposed to be there, and the Speaker of the House, who is omnipotent over all parts of the chamber, has no control over the occupants of that gilded cage, and is technically assumed to be ignorant of their presence. The Speaker can, on proper occasions, order strangers to withdraw from all the other galleries set apart for the use of outsiders, but he has no power over the ladies, who sit in the gallery high above his chair. It has even happened that when subjects had, as a matter of necessity, to be discussed in the House of Commons, which the Speaker did not consider quite suitable for an audience of both sexes, he has sent a private and unofficial intimation to the ladies' gallery that it would, in his opinion, be more seemly if its occupants were to withdraw. But on some occasions a few of the ladies declined to withdraw, and the Speaker had no power to enforce his advice, seeing that technically there was no ladies' gallery within his jurisdiction. Sometime, no doubt, the House of Commons will adopt more reasonable regulations and will recognize the right of women to be treated as rational creatures, as members of the community, as citizens and allowed to sit as men do in the open gallery and listen to the debates which must always more or less concern their own interests. It is a curious fact that the galleries and other parts of the House of Lords to which women have admission are open to the public gaze just as those parts of the House in which male strangers are permitted to listen to the debates of the peers. In the year 1835, the public mind of these countries was much surprised and even startled by the discovery, or what at least seemed to be the discovery, of a great and portentous plot against the established order of succession to the throne. This plot was declared to be carried on by the Orange Societies, which had for many years been growing up in Great Britain and Ireland, and throughout many of the colonies and dependencies. This Orange organization began in the north of Ireland, and was originally intended to crush out the Catholic associations, which were then coming into existence all over Ireland, for the political and religious emancipation of the Roman Catholics, and for strengthening the national cause in the Irish Parliament. There is so little to be said in defense or even excuse of the Orange organization in its earlier years that it seems only fair to admit the possibility of its having been seriously intended in the beginning for the defense of Great Britain against an Irish rebellion fomented and supported by France. The Orange Association took their title from the name of the royal house, which had given William III as sovereign to England, and the name of Orange was understood to illustrate its hostility to all Jacobite plots and schemes, which were naturally assumed to have the countenance and the favor of England's foreign enemies. We have seen already in the course of this history how the Orange Societies acted before the rebellion of 98 in Ireland, 
and how orange and green became the rival colors of those who denounced and those who supported every Irish national movement. When the rebellion was suppressed and Grattan's parliament was extinguished, the orange associations were not in the least disposed to admit that their work had been accomplished and that there was no further need for their active existence. On the contrary, they increased their efforts to spread their power all over the country, and claiming for themselves the credit of having been a main influence on the suppression of the Irish rebellion, they appealed for the support of all loyal Englishmen to increase their numbers and strengthen their hands. Orangeism, which had at first only been known in Ireland, began to spread widely throughout Great Britain. Orange lodges were everywhere formed, orange grand masters were appointed, a whole vocabulary of orange titles, passwords, and phrases were invented, a complete hierarchy of orange officialism was created, and an invisible network of orangeism held the members of the organization together. The orange conspiracy, if we may call it so, had been spreading its ramifications energetically during the later years of George the Fourth's reign, and had succeeded in obtaining the countenance and indeed the active support of many peers, of at least some bishops, and even of certain members of the royal family. The Duke of York, who in that time stood nearest in the succession to the throne, was a patron of the societies, and was invited to become Grand Master of the whole organization. The invitation would in all probability have been accepted if the Duke had not been assured on the most authoritative advice that a secret organization of such a nature was distinctly an illegal body. When the Duke died, and it seemed all but certain that the next King of England would be his brother William, Duke of Clarence, the Orange Lodges transferred their allegiance to the Duke of Cumberland, who consented to become their Grand Master. The Duke of Cumberland, as we have already seen, was a Tory of the most extreme order, an inveterate enemy to every kind of reform and every progressive movement, a man who was not merely unpopular, but thoroughly detested among all classes who valued political freedom, religious liberty, and the spread of education. Soon after William the Fourth's succession to the throne, a new impulse was given to Orangeism by the king's yielding to the demand for popular reform, and by the measures and the movements which began to follow the passing of Lord Grey's reform bill. The Orangemen all over these countries then began to look upon the Duke of Cumberland as their natural leader, and there can be little doubt that in the minds of many of them, in the minds of some of the most influential among them, there was growing up the wild hope that the Duke of Cumberland might become King of England. The Orange Lodges became a vast secret organization with signs and passwords, a mysterious political confraternity, the Grand Master of which was a sort of head center, to adopt a phrase belonging to a more modern conspiracy, and performing indeed something like the part which constitutional Freemasonry at one time aspired to play. The Orange Lodges in Great Britain and Ireland swelled in numbers until they had more than 300,000 members, solemnly and secretly sworn to obey all the orders of the leaders. More than that, the emissaries of the Orange Lodges contrived to make their influence widely felt in the army, and it became clear afterwards that a large number of soldiers were sworn confederates of the association. Some of the explanations which were afterwards given to account for the sudden spread of Orangeism might well appear incredible at first to an intelligent reader of our day not acquainted with this singular chapter of history. But it was afterwards made perfectly certain that a large number of credulous persons were prevailed upon to join the Orange ranks by the positive assurance that the Duke of Wellington had formed the determination to seize the crown of England and put it on his own head, and that the Duke of Cumberland, was the only man who could save the realm from this treasonable enterprise. It seems hardly possible now to understand that there could have been one human creature in England, silly and ignorant enough to believe the Duke of Wellington capable of so preposterous and so wicked a scheme. Lord John Russell has left it on record that when he visited Napoleon in his exile at Elba, the fallen emperor 
during the course of a long conversation, expressed his strong belief that Wellington would seize the crown of England. Lord John endeavored to convince him that such an idea went entirely outside the limits of sober reality. But Napoleon refused to be convinced, and blandly put the question aside with the manner of one who knows better, but does not particularly care to impress his opinion on unwilling ears. One can easily understand how such an idea might come into the mind of Napoleon, who knew little or nothing about the actual conditions of English political and social life, and who had experience of his own to demonstrate the possibility of a great military conqueror becoming at once the ruler of a state. But it seems hard indeed to understand how any sane Englishman could have believed that the simple, loyal, unselfish Duke of Wellington could allow such an idea to enter his mind for a moment, or could see his way to make it a reality even if he did entertain it. Yet it cannot be doubted that numbers of Englishmen were induced to join Orange Lodges by the positive assurance that thus only could they save the state from Wellington's daring ambition. One of the principal instruments of the Orange organization was a certain Colonel Fairman who held an important position in what may be called its military hierarchy and was undoubtedly at one time entrusted by the Duke of Cumberland with the fullest authority to act as the emissary of the Grand Master to make known his will and convey his orders. Whether the Duke of Cumberland ever really entertained the project described to him of seizing the crown for himself and shutting out the Princess Victoria can in all probability never be known as a certainty, but there can be no question that his actions often justified such a belief and that many of his most devoted Orange followers looked up to him as the resolute hero of such a project to save England from Whigs and Liberals and Roman Catholics and mob orators and petticoat government and all other such enemies to the good old state of things as established by the wisdom of our ancestors and the act of settlement. The whole question was raised in the House of Commons during the session of 1835 by Joseph Hume, the consistent and persevering advocate of sound economic doctrine, of political freedom, of peace, retrenchment, and reform. Hume obtained the appointment of a committee to inquire into the whole subject, and the committee had no great difficulty in finding out that Colonel Fairman had been carrying on, with or without the consent or authority of his Grand Master, the Duke of Cumberland, what might be called a treasonable conspiracy through the Orange Lodges, and even through Orangemen who were actually serving in the King's army. In 1836, Hume brought up the question once again and obtained so much support from Lord John Russell, then acting as leader of the government in the House of Commons, that an address was unanimously voted to the King, calling on him to proclaim the condemnation of the Orange conspiracy. The Duke of Cumberland disclaimed all treasonable purposes, and declared that many of the steps taken by Fairman and other Orange emissaries had been taken without his orders, and even without his knowledge. Fairman disappeared from the scene when the crisis seemed to become too serious for his personal convenience, and one of the Orange emissaries, against whom a prosecution was to be instituted, was removed by a sudden death from the reach of criminal law. The Duke of Cumberland announced that he had already of his own inspiration ordered the dissolution of the Orange Lodges. The King, in his reply to the address in the House of Commons, declared himself entirely in accordance with the resolutions of the House, and thus the whole conspiracy came to an end, and the government thought it well to allow the subject to pass into obscurity without further action. This was the end of the Orange organization, as it was known in the days of William the Fourth. At a later date, Orangism was again revived, but only in the form which it still maintains, by which it is now known to us all as a political association openly avowing legitimate opinions and purposes, and is fairly entitled to existence as any political club or other such organization recognized in the movements of modern life. The treasonable conspiracy, like many another evil, died when it was compelled to endure the light of day. Section 22 
of a history of the four georges and of william the fourth volume four by justin mccarthy and justin huntley mccarthy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter seventy nine the close of a reign and the opening of an era many lives that now belong to history had faded into history during the reign of william the fourth william wilberforce the great champion of every noble and philanthropic movement known to his times had passed from the living world which he had done so much to improve wilberforce lived to see the triumph of that movement against slavery and the slave trade which he more than any other of his time had inspired and promoted he had been compelled by ill health to give up his position in parliament for several years before his death but he had never withdrawn his watchful sympathy and such cooperation as it was in his power to give from any cause to which he had consecrated his life his name will always be illustrious in english history as that of one who loved his fellow-men and who gave expression to that love in every act and effort of his public and private career jeremy bentham one of the greatest of modern thinkers the founder of more than one school of political and economic doctrine a man whose influence on human thought is never likely to pass altogether away died in june eighteen thirty two bentham's principle the greatest happiness of the greatest number has often been narrowly and unfairly judged but it may be doubted whether a sounder principle of political and social government has ever come out of the mere wisdom of man the phrase utilitarianism which came into use as the summary of his teaching has often been misunderstood and misapplied and perhaps some excuse was found for the misinterpretation of his meaning in his decision that his dead body should be given up for the purpose of anatomy and not buried in the earth to be of service only to the worms many of us have seen the skeleton of jeremy bentham clothed in his habit as he lived in a room of that university college which he helped to make a success sir james mackintosh brought his noble career to a close during this reign mackintosh had been historian philosopher and politician and like macaulay he had rendered great services in india as well as in england like macaulay also he had been listened to with the deepest interest whenever he addressed the house of commons although his gifts and his temperament seemed suited rather for the study than for parliamentary life another man whose death belongs to the reign of william the fourth whose teachings were at one time the occasion for incessant controversy and indeed caused much controversy where they were least understood was thomas robert malthus in many classes of readers the name of malthus came to be associated for a while with the idea of some strange and cruel doctrine which taught that wars and pestilences and other calamities that have the effect of sweeping redundant populations off the world are really good things in themselves to be encouraged by beneficent legislation it is hardly necessary to say now that nothing could be more narrow and even more perverse than this interpretation of malthus's philosophy another of the teaching minds that passed from the contemplation of earthly subjects during the reign was that of james mill the historian of british india and the promulgator of great doctrines in political economy james mill like edmund burke had studied india thoroughly and come to understand it as few men had done who had lived there for years and years although like burke he had never been within sight of the shores of hindustan mill divined india as talleyrand said that alexander hamilton the american statesman and companion of george washington had divined europe charles greville writing in november eighteen thirty speaks of meeting at breakfast young mill a political economist and adds that young mill is the son of mill who wrote the history of british india and said to be cleverer than his father 
the elder Mill would no doubt have gladly endorsed the saying, and it may be assumed that history has given its judgment in the same way, but history will certainly maintain the fame of the father as well as the fame of the son. A man of very different order from any of those we have just mentioned, but who has made a reputation of his own in literature as well as in politics, closed his career within the same reign. We have already spoken in this volume of William Cobbett's command of simple strong English, which made his prose style hardly inferior to that of Swift himself. Indeed, one of the most distinguished authors of the present day, a man who has made a name in political life as well as in literature, has been heard to contend with earnestness that as a writer of pure strong idiomatic English, Cobbett might be accounted the rival of Swift. The great engineer Telford, and the really gifted and genuine, although eccentric and opinionated physician, Dr. Abernethy, were among the celebrities whose deaths, rather than their works, belonged to the time when William the Fourth was king. Poetry, romance, and art suffered many heavy losses during the same time. We have already chronicled the death of Walter Scott. One who had known him and had been kindly welcomed by him, James Hogg, the Ettrick Shepherd, died three years after Scott in 1835. The death of George Crabbe was one of the memorable events of the reign. Crabbe might well be described in the words which a later singer set out for his own epitaph as the poet of the poor. Crabbe pictured the struggles, the sufferings, the occasional gleams of happiness, which are common to the lives of the poor with a realism as vigorous and as vivid as the prose of Charles Dickens himself could show, and he had touches here and there of exquisite tender poetic feeling which were not unworthy of Keats or Wordsworth. Nothing was nobler in the life of Burke than his early appreciation and generous support of Crabbe. Hannah Moore died in 1833. The fame of this remarkable woman has somewhat faded of late years, and even the most successful of her writings find probably but few readers among the general public. She has, however, won for herself a distinct place in history, not less by her life itself than by her work in various fields of literature. In her early days, she had been an associate of Samuel Johnson, Burke, and Goldsmith and Reynolds, and she had known Macaulay from his childhood. She was always a writer with a purpose, whether she wrote a religious tract or an ethical essay, a tragedy or a novel. She always strove to be a teacher, and the intellectual gifts with which she had been endowed were only valued by her, in so far as they enabled her to serve the education and the moral progress of humanity. The rapt one of the godlike forehead, the heaven-eyed creature, as Wordsworth described Samuel Taylor Coleridge, died in 1834. Coleridge belonged to an order of intellect far higher than that to which Crabbe or Hannah Moore had any claim. He was indeed a man of genius in all but the very highest meaning of the word. He was poet, philosopher, teacher, and critic, and in each department, had he worked in that alone, he might have won renown. Perhaps, if he had not worked in so many fields, he might have obtained even a more exalted position than that which history must assuredly assign to him. His influence as a philosopher is probably fading now, although he unquestionably inspired whole schools of philosophic thought, and the world remembers him rather as the author of The Ancient Mariner than as the metaphysical student and teacher. As a critic, in the highest sense of the word, he will always have the praise that should belong to the first who aroused the attention of Englishmen to the great new school of thoughtful criticism which was growing up in Germany under the influence of Lessing and Goethe. He would have deserved fame if only for his translations of some of Schiller's noblest dramas. It has been justly said that Coleridge, by his successful efforts, to spread over England the influence of the higher German criticism, did much to restore Shakespeare to that position as head of the world's modern literature from which English criticism and English tastes 
had done so much to displace him since the days of Dryden. The death of Coleridge was soon followed by that of Charles Lamb, and indeed Coleridge's death may have had some effect in hastening that of his dear and devoted friend. In the same poem from which we have just quoted, the lines that picture Coleridge, Wordsworth tells how Lamb the frolic and the gentle has vanished from his lonely hearth. Lamb was the most exquisite of essayists and letter-writers, a man whose delicate humor, playful irony, and happy gift of picturesque phrase claim for him true poetic genius. The present generation has probably but a faint memory of Felicia Hemans, whose verse had at one time an immense popularity among all readers with whom sweetness of sentiment, musical ease, and fluency of verse and simple tenderness of feeling were enough to constitute poetic art. She, too, died not long before the close of the reign. Many men who had won wide fame as pulpit orators and as religious teachers of various orders marked by their deaths as well as by their lives this chapter of history. Roland Hill was one of these, the great popular preacher, who flung aside conventionalities and was ready to preach anywhere if he had hope of gathering an audience around him whom he could move and teach, whether he spoke from the pulpit of a church or a chapel, or from a platform in the open air, or in the midst of a crowd with no platform at all. Another was Robert Hall, admittedly one of the most eloquent preachers of modern times. Yet another was Adam Clark, the author of the celebrated Commentary on the Holy Scriptures. Of course, the fame of these men and women does not belong in the fuller sense to the reign of William the Fourth. Some of them had well nigh done their work before the reign began. None of them can be said to have won any new celebrity during the reign. Their names are introduced here because their deaths were events of the moment, and lend in that way additional importance to the reign's history. The fame of Mrs. Siddons can hardly be said to belong in any sense to the days when William the Fourth sat on the English throne, for she had retired from the stage many years before his accession, and only appeared in public on rare occasions and for some charitable object. But she died within the reign, and it must therefore find another distinction by its association with her name. Two years later died Edmund Kean, who also may be said to have closed his career as an actor before the reign had begun. Of the fame that is won on the boards of a theater, posterity can only judge by hearsay. The poet, the novelist, the historian, the philosopher, the painter, the sculptor, leave their works always living behind them, and the later generation has the same materials on which to form its judgment as were open to the world when the author or artist had just completed his work. Even the orator can bequeath to all ages the words he has spoken, although they are no longer to be accompanied by the emphasis of his gesture and accentuated by the music of his voice. Of the actor and the actress, who have long passed away, we can know nothing but what their contemporaries have told us, and can form no judgment of our own. We can hardly be wrong, however, in regarding Mrs. Siddons as by far the greatest tragic actress who has ever appeared on the English stage, and Edmund Keane as the greatest actor of Shakespearean tragedy whom England has seen since the days of Garrick. In mentioning these two names, we must also be reminded of the name of Charles Matthews the Elder, an actor of extraordinary versatility and genuine dramatic power, who is, however, best remembered as the originator of the style of theatrical entertainment, which may be described as the at-home performance, in which he probably never had a rival. Many of us can still remember his yet more gifted son, the younger Charles Matthews, the incomparable light comedian of a later day. We have told thus far in this chapter only of lights going out in literature, art, philosophy, theology, and science. Let us relieve the picture by recording that one rising star of the first magnitude in literature 
cast its earliest rays over these latest years of William IV. Early in 1836, the sketches of Boz were published in a collected form, and a little later in the same year appeared the first number of Pickwick Papers. Then the world began to know that a man of thoroughly original genius had arisen, and before the rain was out, the young author Charles Dickens was accorded by all those whose judgment was worth having that place among the foremost English novelists which he has ever since retained, and is likely to retain. The Pickwick Papers opened a new era in the history of English novel writing. By a curious coincidence, the proposal of a young art student to furnish illustrations for Dickens's books, being declined by the author, led the young art student to believe that he had mistaken his vocation in trying to illustrate the works of other men, and he turned his attention to literature and afterwards became the one great rival of Dickens, and will be known to all time as the author of Vanity Fair and the Newcombs. None of the writings which made Thackeray's fame appeared during the time of William the Fourth, but his name may be associated with the close of the reign by the incident which brought him into an acquaintanceship with Dickens and which led to his abandoning the pencil for the pen. Toward the close of the reign died one of the most audacious and astonishing impostors known to modern times. Even the Tickborn claimant of the reign that followed makes but a poor show for inventiveness and enterprise when compared with the woman who described herself as the Princess Olivia of Cumberland, and who claimed to be the daughter of King William's brother. This woman was the daughter of a house painter named Wilmot, and was educated under the care of her uncle, the rector of a parish in Warwickshire. She received a good education, and even in her young days seemed to have a desire to exhibit herself as the heroine of strange adventures. At an early age she was married to John Sayers, a man distinguished in his art, who obtained the position of painter to the king and the Duke of Clarence, afterwards William the Fourth, and it was probably this association with the surroundings of great personages that inspired her with some of her bold conceptions. Her husband and she did not get on very well together, and a separation took place, after which for a while Mrs. Serres appeared on the stage and then took to the art of painting on her own account, and actually succeeded in getting herself appointed landscape painter to the Prince of Wales. Her next attempt was at novel writing, and she also published a volume of poems and even ventured on the composition of an opera. Later still she made herself conspicuous by writing a volume to prove that her uncle, the Reverend James Wilmot, was the actual author of the letters of Junius. That was only a beginning, for she soon after proclaimed herself the legitimate daughter by a secret marriage of the Duke of Cumberland. She made her claims known to the Prince Regent and all the other members of the royal family, and demanded a formal hearing in order that she might prove her right to rank as one of them. She was so far successful that her claim was actually taken up by a member of the House of Commons, who moved for the appointment of a committee of the House to give it a full investigation. Sir Robert Peel promptly settled the question so far as regarded the appointment of a committee by announcing that he held in his hand a manifesto of the Princess Olivia addressed to the high powers of the Kingdom of Poland, in which she claimed to be the descendant of Stanislaus Augustus. Sir Robert Peel urged that as the two claims were practically irreconcilable and were both made by the same claimant, the House of Commons might consider itself relieved from the necessity of appointing a committee of inquiry, and the House accepted his advice. Still, it is almost needless to say that many persons were found quite willing to believe in the genuineness of the Princess Olivia's claim, and even in the genuineness of both her claims, and she had indeed for a time a party of faithful and credulous followers, as strong as that which backed up the pretensions of the adventurer from Wapping, who proclaimed himself to be Sir Roger Tickborn. 
the later years of the self-created princess olivia were spent in poverty and she died within the rules of the king's bench even in much later days however her name was not wholly forgotten a few lines may be spared to describe the career of a man who died not long after the death of princess olivia and who belonged to that class which used to be described as wonderful characters this was a man named james norris who came of a family of good position having property near devise norris received a good education and at one time promised to make a name for himself as a student of natural history he is described as handsome in person and elegant in manners and we are told that he possessed a highly cultivated mind which seemed to promise in early life eminence in society and that he would rise to be an ornament to the age in which he lived at a comparatively early age he had outlived all his family and thus became the owner of large landed property he suddenly became prey to strange overmastering habits of indolence apathy and shyness which gradually estranged him from all society he neglected his property allowed his rents to remain for years and years in the hands of a steward without troubling himself about them and allowed his dividends to grow up in the hands of his bankers without concerning himself as to their amount or even opening any letters which might be addressed to him on the subject he gave up shaving and allowed his hair and beard to grow as they would he never changed his clothing or his linen until they had become worn to rags he lay in bed for the greater part of the day took his principal meal about midnight then had a lonely ramble and returned to bed as the morning grew nearer he was hardly ever seen by anybody but his servants and declined any communication even with his nearest neighbors when an occasion arose which actually compelled him to communicate with any one from the outer world he would only consent to speak with a door or at least a screen between him and the other party to the conversation all the time he does not seem to have been engaged in any manner of study or work and he appears to have simply devoted himself to the full indulgence of his passion for solitude his figure or some sketch suggested by it has been made use of more than once by writers of fiction but the man himself was a living figure in the reign of william the fourth and he died not long before its close under the date of march thirty first eighteen thirty seven charles greville writes among the many old people who have been cut off by this severe weather one of the most remarkable is mrs fitz herbert who died at brighton at above eighty years of age she was not a clever woman but a very noble spirit disinterested generous honest and affectionate greatly beloved by her friends and relations popular in the world and treated with uniform distinction and respect by the royal family the death of this celebrated woman recalls to memory one of the saddest and most shameful chapters in the whole sad and shameful story of the utterly worthless prince who became george the fourth meanwhile the reign of william the fourth was hastening to its close the king had had several attacks of illness and more than once before the end was yet quite near his physical condition went down so low that those around him believed it impossible for him to rise again he rallied however more than once and regained his good spirits and gave hope to those who had any real wish for his recovery that the reign had not yet quite come to an end in some of his better moods he showed glimpses of that higher nature which was wont to assert itself fitfully now and then at many periods of his career more than once he prayed fervently in these later days that his life might be spared until the princess victoria should come of age almost to the end the usual festivities were kept up at windsor castle and the queen by his wish visited the racecourse at ascot a few days before the end came but it is recorded that she only remained an hour on the ground the formal announcement that the king was seriously ill was not made until within a few days of the sovereign's death even when regular bulletins began to be issued they were so sparing of their information and so carefully guarded against any suggestion of alarm that the outer public had really very little to go upon except the bare fact 
that the king was growing to be an old man, and that he was liable to fits of illness, just as he had been for years before. It would appear that it was William's whim to dictate the bulletins himself, and that he was very anxious not to allow a word to go forth which might convey a knowledge of his actual condition. The poor old sovereign was apparently inspired by the full conviction that the prolongation of his life was of the utmost importance to the welfare of his people, and it may be fully believed that his unwillingness to admit the imminence of danger to his life came from an honest sort of public purpose. He gave his attention to the business of the state almost to the very last. All the time, those who were immediately around the sinking sovereign knew quite well that the end was close at hand, and were already consulting earnestly and constantly as to the steps which ought to be taken to prepare for the new reign, even as to the matter of mere ceremonials which were to accompany the accession of a woman as sovereign. On June 16th, Greville says, Met Sir Robert Peel in the park and talked with him about the beginning of the new reign. He said that it was very desirable that the young queen should appear as much as possible emancipated from all restraint and exhibit a capacity for the discharge of her high functions. That the most probable as well as the most expedient course she could adopt would be to rely entirely on the advice of Melbourne and she might with great propriety say that she thought it incumbent on her to follow the example which had been set up by her two uncles her predecessors, George IV and William IV. Each of these had retained the ministers whom he found in office, though not quite of his own pattern. There were some fears at the time that Leopold, king of the Belgians, might hasten over to England and might exercise, or at least be suspected of exercising, an undue influence over the young Princess Victoria. Headers at the present day will notice, perhaps with peculiar interest, the observation made by Greville that Lord Durham is on his way home, and his return is regarded with no little curiosity, because he may endeavor to play a great political part, and materially to influence the opinions, or at least the counsels of the Queen. Lord Durham, up to this time, was regarded by most people merely as a radical of a very advanced order, burning with strong political ambitions, fitfully impelled with passionate likings and dislikings, and capable of proving a serious trouble to the quiet of the new reign. We know now that Durham was soon drawn away almost altogether from home politics, disappointing thereby many of his radical admirers, and that he found a new field of success and established for himself an abiding place in history as the statesman to whose courage, energy, and genius is owing the foundation of the self-governing, prosperous, peaceful, and loyal dominion of Canada, which has again and again proved itself in recent times an important part of the empire's strength. Writing of the Princess Victoria, Greville goes on to say, what renders speculation so easy and events uncertain is the absolute ignorance of everybody, without exception, of the character, disposition, and capacity of the princess. She has been kept in such jealous seclusion by her mother, never having slept out of her bedroom nor been alone with anybody but herself and the Baroness Leitzen, that not one of her acquaintance, none of the attendants of Kensington, not even the Duchess of Northumberland, her governess, have any idea what she is or what she promises to be. Greville tells us that the Tories are in great consternation at the king's approaching death, because they fear that the new sovereign is not likely to make any advances to them, while the Whigs, to do them justice, behave with great decency, whatever they may really feel. They express a very proper concern, and I have no doubt Melbourne really feels the concern he expresses. Then Greville dismisses for the moment the whole subject with the words, The public in general don't seem to care much and only wonder what will happen. The chronicler no doubt expressed very correctly the public feeling. Of course there is nothing surprising in the fact that while the poor king lay dying, those who had any official relations with the court or with the parliament were occupying themselves during the greater part of the time with speculations as to the immediate changes which his death would bring about, and with discussions and disputations as to the proper arrangements and ceremonials to accompany and to follow his passing away from the world. 
something of the same kind must have happened in the case of any Windsor shopkeeper whose family and friends were in hourly expectation of his death, and it is only when such discussions and arrangements come to be recorded as a part of the history of a reign that we are likely to feel impressed by the difference between the prosaic, practical details of the business of this world and the sacred solemnity of the event that is supposed already to cast its shadow before. There appears to have been some dispute between the authorities of church and state as to the offering up of prayers in the churches for the recovery of the king. William was anxious that the prayers should be offered at once, and the privy council assembled to make the order. But the Bishop of London raised an objection, not to the offering of the prayers, but to the suggestion that the prayers were to be offered in obedience to an order coming from the lords and council. The bishop maintained that the lords had no power to make any such order. In the discussion which took place, it appears that some eminent lawyers were of opinion that even the king himself had no power to order the use of any particular prayers, or at all events, that even if he had had such power, it was in virtue of his position as head of the church, and not as head of the state. This was indeed to raise what the late Baron Bramwell once humorously described as a most delightful point of law. The difficulty appears to have been got over by a sort of compromise the Archbishop of Canterbury, undertaking to order on his own authority that prayers should be offered up in all churches for the king's recovery, and the order was no doubt dutifully obeyed. To complete the satirical humor of the situation, King William ought actually to have died while the dispute was still going on as to the precise authority by which prayers were to be offered up for his recovery but some sort of effective arrangement was made during the monarch's few remaining hours of life, and the appeal on his behalf was duly made. On June nineteenth, the king was found to be falling deeper and deeper into weakness, which seemed to put all chance of his recovery out of reasonable consideration, and the sacrament was administered to him by the Archbishop of Canterbury. One of the king's last utterances may be set down, as in the best sense characteristic. It illustrated, that is to say, the best side of his character. Believe me were the words of the dying king, that I have always been a religious man. It may be admitted in justice to William that, according to his generally dull and often confused and hazy lights, he did always recognize the standard higher than that of mere expediency, or political compromise, or personal convenience, set up to regulate the conduct even of princes. The reign came to an end on June thirtieth, 1837. Shortly after two o'clock that morning, King William passed away. He died calmly and without a struggle. The closing hours of his life had a resignation and a dignity about them which might well have fitted the end of one whose whole career, public and private, had been more dignified and more noble than that of the poor, eccentric, restless, illiterate personage who succeeded the last of the Georges on the throne of England. It must be owned that whatever the personal defects and disadvantages of the sovereign, the reign of King William IV had been more beneficent in politics than that of any of his predecessors since the days of Queen Anne. For the first time in the modern history of England, the voice of the people had been authorized by legislation to have some influence over the direction of national affairs. The passing of the great reform measure and the rush of other reforms which followed it opened the way for a new system of administration, the beneficial effects of which in the political and social life of the empire have been expanding ever since. With the reign of William the Fourth the principle of personal rule, or rule by the mere decree and will of the sovereign, came to an end. If the reign is to be judged by the work it accomplished, it cannot but be set down in history as a great reign. Perhaps there are few men in England, of whatever class, high or low, who had less of the quality of personal greatness than William the Fourth. He had greatness thrust upon him, by the mere fact that fate would have him king. He contributed nothing toward the accomplishment of the many important works which are the best monuments of his reign, 
except by the negative merit of having at least not done anything to prevent their being accomplished. Even this, however, is a claim to the respect of posterity, which must be denied to some of his nearest predecessors. He ruled over a great country without acquiring during his course an equality of greatness for himself. He was like the glass of the window, which admits the light of the sun without any light-creating power of its own. End of section 22 Recording by Pamela Nagami End of A History of the Four Georges and of William the Fourth Volume 4 by Justin McCarthy and Justin Huntley McCarthy